Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> through you, I guess, to Rob, so, uh, and maybe to our bylaw. Uh, time frame right now, I think we have to submit, stop at 11 p.m. Right. So we'd be asking till midnight. Yes. And if I can ask just kind of what type of noise, we've had some people in Port Carling in the past object to uh, amplified sound. Um, Stones coming to play. Anybody exciting? Uh, there will be live a band. Uh, it's a band from Bracebridge, uh, Kurt Dunlop and his group. So it's it's a band, but uh, um, uh, and if we could uh, carry on till twelve, that might just uh, help the party out. I simply attended in case there were questions, so if Council is supportive of the exemption, uh, it would simply require approval and then a letter to the McKees advising them that they have authorization to, uh, to be exempt from the noise bylaw for that one hour period. Well, the, the wedding isn't until September, so we can deal with it between, we'll come back um, at the next round of meetings with an, uh, if council is, or committee is supportive with a nodding of heads, we will bring something forward at the next meeting to address it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, members of the public, the township has received a site plan agreement application, SPA 2619, in the name of TD Cub Holdings Limited. The property is at 167 Medora Street, Port Carling. This is the property that is the fixtures, T squared, and Muskoka Modern Building. Uh, there's a site plan on page 26 of your agenda package. The site plan application specifically is for the construction of a 2,400 square foot garage slash storage building to be used in conjunction with an existing commercial uses on site. The architecture of the building is flat roofed, metal sided uh, with a dark gray exterior. The property is in the area one full service area, which requires a connection to full services. However, it's our understanding that no services will be installed within this building. Access will be obtained through existing entrances. Stormwater report has been prepared by Pinestone Engineering. They've confirmed that there is a negligible increase on peak flow runoff volumes. There's no lighting proposed on this building, and we have received comments from the district. I'll summarize them quickly. The district indicates that this property currently has full water and sewer services, and the developer is required to undertake upgrading of the connection at their own expense if required. The district indicates in regarding transport and access that Medora Road is a district road and a widening may be sought for any concurrent or successive site plan or consent applications. Regarding stormwater management, the district assumes that post-development flows will remain comparatively balanced with pre-development. Waste management will not change and this property is not located near a landfill site or dump. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Good morning, my name is Trina Clark and I'm here from T-Squared Design Studio, 167 Medora Street, Port Carling, Ontario, P0B1J0. Um, and as mentioned, it's a site plan approval for a garage slash storage building. So over the years, the business has grown and now requires a proper, um, proper shop and storage space. Currently, there are shipping containers on the property, storing the equipment and materials, and this new building would allow all of those storage containers to be removed and to clean up the yard. The proposed structure, as seen in the site plan, will actually be located behind an existing garage, so it provides a buffer from the road. 
The structure is to be constructed of steel, which matches the existing structures that are on the property right now and keeping in a cohesive design on site. Um, as Ryan had mentioned, no exterior lighting is being proposed and the garage, or sorry, proposed on the garage. And it was questioned in the report what the percentage of the landscape area was on the property. And it is in fact 39%, so it's actually above what is required. Um, the structure is actually ready to be built and it was thought that this application would only require an amendment to the original site plan, not another presentation in front of the council. So with that being said, we would like to possibly request that the approval be moved up to be reviewed tomorrow by council instead of being, instead of having to wait another month. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, through you and to uh, planning. Um, I specifically have questions on page 24. The second paragraph, um, it, it talks about consideration of a tree planting and fencing along a portion of uh, the southern east lot lines could be considered. And my question is, why wouldn't we do this um, to make it more Muskoka looking? And then I had two follow up questions. Through you, uh, I think the important page to look at is page 26, which is the site plan. Sorry. We're, we're laserless today. Um, the the southern lot line, which is the the bottom um, the bottom lot line, uh, it abuts a property that's presently zoned residential. Those are the lands that are known as the port of call lands. There was a previous plan of subdivision that was approved on those lands. Um, that subdivision has not proceeded. The lands are still zoned residential. The official plan, when you have two abutting uh, uses, commercial and residential, for example, screening and buffering can be considered. There presently is no development on the property. Hopefully one day we would see development on those port of call lands and hoping to maintain those lands to be desirable for future residential development, some type of buffering or screening of the, the parking area and yard area could be considered on this property. The Port of Call development may choose to provide additional screening on their own lands if necessary, but given the fact that there's a site plan agreement before Council, given that this is a commercial use, given that it does have a storage contractor's yard component to it, we thought that it was appropriate to at least highlight the fact that Council or Committee could ask for fencing, screening, some type of buffering along those lot lines. Okay, I'll just hold off to the end, but I've got two other points. The, um, I guess the second one, uh, implementation of buffering landscape expected for future buildings. You just sort of talked about that. And um, we talked, uh, you talk about a 30% lot area coverage um, that we're going to do an assessment. Now, did you, do we have done that assessment yes, yet? Through you. Um, Trina had, had mentioned that they have confirmed that 30% of the area is presently landscaped. Uh, we have a very general interpretation of landscaping. Grassing uh, would be considered landscaping. It doesn't have to be tree plantings or naturalized areas. Okay. You have a general, okay. So my only out to my peers then would be would for future, should we start that ball rolling to start consider the, the tree planting and fencing along the south side? And that, I just throw that out. I would certainly support this endeavor. I think continuous improvement uh, is certainly part of my economic development uh, mindset. And uh, having driven by there and seen the trailers and the, the other storage aspects, I think this cleans it up wonderfully. I think it makes it a, just a better place. And I certainly uh, am all for this, whether there's trees or not. I mean, I, if we want to consider that as a council, fine. Sorry, um, well, Councillor Al Roberts brought um, some suggestions, and I just wondered if Council had any comments about those. Yes, I would certainly support some form of screening. I think I think it's important to create that differential. Probably doesn't seem important now, but it will if there's residential there. Okay. 
Um, I, I don't have a problem with the screening. It's a wooded tree lot theoretically beside it present. You know, we've got a commercial building in there that's going to make it nicer than the current uh, structure that's there. Um, they're there first. You know, we, we keep adding costs every time we add someone. You've got to plant 14 trees. You've got to put a fence up. You've got to do whatever. And that in itself, from a, a water quality, again, if there was a specific park beside that people were accessing and didn't need to see an increase in development, all this is doing is cleaning up, and whether I see a building or I don't see a building, even from the abutting lot, I'm sure that any residential development is going to keep some tree buffer up there in itself. So um, I wouldn't be in favor necessarily. I think it's uh, undue hardship to the developer. I just wanted to comment that um, having a contractor's yard um, close by and the effects on the residential development, I think that that buffer is important. Um, it's not, in my opinion, it, it's not just up to the neighboring property owner to create that buffer. I think it's a, it's a combined um, uh, action that both properties need to address and I'm not sure how staff can address that or give us direction if, if in fact there is a, a need and want from um, <coughs> council or committee through you a, a resolution is before you <clears throat> that can include uh, those details if it hasn't already been written up to um, to include some uh, degree of landscaping and buffering I think staff can work with um, the applicant um, to determine what that buffering looks like if it's a if it's a hedgerow um, of cedars or pine uh, to provide a, a degree of visual buffering or if, is it fencing but I would look to committee to help staff understand you know, what type and amount of buffering you'd be looking for is it a row of trees is it fencing um, is it a single line of trees is it is it a, is it a double width uh, row of trees that would be helpful on our end to understand what committee would actually be looking for could you also remind us, though, that what we have um, asked for on other properties, similar to, I, I recall um, when you mentioned the double buffering, double row of buffering and things, and we did that, I think, up on 141 in the Raymond area, I believe, with Brent Quarries. I'm not sure if that's exactly the same situation, that, but I just wondered if we could get more guidance of um, it, it from you, is single or double enough through you I, I, th I think in, in the beginning when the trees are small um, a double row um, I think absolutely makes sense when the trees become much more mature and large you know this would be 20 years from now a single row uh, would probably suffice so it's how much um, effort and expense uh, would be required by the applicant at this point and what's the desired um, visual um, benefit to that added row I think that that's that's what I'm struggling with would be not necessarily um, one or two rows which which one is better I, th I think it could be subjective ultimately those trees will be long-lived and there will be a great buffer if it's a single row if it's a double row it will be even better buffer thank you through you it's I liked your word Ryan some like, let's start something do something small just to show evidence of planting trees like not cedars because it, they're eaten by deer but trees to start that evidence of, of rebuilding the Muskoka look that's all so not an expensive thing but just start it so um, I think so, some buffering would be great a single rule would be fine because it, it may be years before they ever ever build the, the subdivision there and you don't want to put too much cost on but uh, and I'm definitely against a fence at, at this point. Uh, it's, this is Muskoka, and you'd like to see trees and that. I look across the road at even the, the lilac bushes there, just, just, just buffer. So it's something reasonable to line.
just running through yourself, I guess, to staff. Can we vote on the buffering as a separate amendment to this specifically? Because I'll be honest, I'm in favor of the. I appreciate that. Okay. But I'd, I'd like to support the redevelopment site plan as approved. I don't need to support my perspective on the added buffering, uh, understanding that, again, if I'm putting a residential subdivision, I've got my own amount of buffer. There's already existing trees there. I can leave them up. Why does the residential development have to clear cut to the property line and expect the commercial development to add the buffering? That's my perspective. And um, so that's why I'd like to vote on specifically the buffering separately. I, I would also suggest though, that it's, it's required from both. Um, and again, um, seeing how some other properties haven't been so kind uh, to the residential neighbors who kept their buffering, but in fact, uh, we didn't add. I think we should look a little more around Muskoka and mostly along 118, but. Um, if we weren't to contemplate trees, w w do we ever uh, require a fence be built? We don't. This is the last ticket. Yeah, I understand. So, so if we don't, we would never require someone to have to build a, a perhaps a ten thousand dollar fence between properties. Then it follows that the buffering aspect is it not one and the same? Is my I guess my perspective. Sorry, moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Harding. Be resolved that the resolution um, be amended to include buffering. Okay. Sorry, should I have read this first? No. Okay. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Buffering is carried. <clears throat> Moved by Councillor Roberts, second by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that the Committee of the Whole recommend to Co Township Council that SPA 2619 TD Chubb Holdings Limited be appro approved subject to the following conditions. Receipt of sa satisfactory comments from the District of Muskoka and implementation, implementation of any requirements. Inclusion of buffering vegetation along the southern Lee side lot line. This approval, approval will expire on July 12th, 2020, unless the corresponding site plan agreement has been entered into and registered on titles of the land. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. David or Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. This next item is a also a site plan matter. Um, this is for a previously approved site plan, SPA 6818 in the name of Knight. This is the Clear Lake Brewing Company uh, property at 4651 Southwood Road in Torrance. If, uh, some of the previous uh, council members or committee members would recall um, a site plan agreement was approved on this property July 11th, 2017. The site plan was specifically to permit the conversion of an existing automobile service station into a microbrewery and restaurant. $12,000, $12,250 in securities was taken for stormwater, parking lot works, grading and landscaping. A letter has been received from Pinestone Engineering certifying that the grading and landscaping conforms with the site plan that was prepared by their office. The applicant is hoping to have the full amount of securities returned. Staff has visited the site. There's pictures provided of the property in the staff report and we have no objections to the securities being returned.
can I ask just the neighboring property that was purchased that we had an application earlier have they merged or will is that supposed to um, I, I wasn't sure if um, somehow this site plan extended into that those lands or not through you the site plan does not extend onto those lands it's my understanding that lots have not merged uh, mr. Knight did not want the merger to occur he was simply uh, trying to provide additional overflow parking uh, during the busy summer time for the two um, uh, the, the two commercial properties the pie and the and the brewery it's moved by councillor Hayes second by councillor oh, wait a minute this one got weird Kelly sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, be it resolved that $12,250 of the securities held in relation to SPA 6816 <clears throat> Knight, roll number 6 6 101, Clear Lake Brewing Company, be returned in recognition of the completed works on site. All in favor? That's fully carried. Sorry, yes, sorry. Sorry, the last application, uh, Chubb Holdings, I believe they asked if it could be moved forward to uh, tomorrow's agenda, and I don't think we actually discussed that. Um, sorry, yes, we can open f for discussion. Uh, there was a decision made by this council early on when we started that we weren't going to do add-ons, um, but I will look to the mayor for uh, direction. Um, you know, I, we, we have added some things on in the past. I, I agree with you. Um, <clears throat> come 30 days from now, it's not possible uh, unless it came directly to council. Um, I uh, won't express my personal opinion. I think probably many of you know my personal opinion. I'll look to council as to what we are committee as to whether or not we want to advance this and amend our agenda tomorrow or not. To the chair. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, would you re re refresh my memory on, on why we elected to make sure that we didn't move things forward? <clears throat> Generally speaking, if I may, the, the concept between what we deal in a committee structure is discussed, debated, and then we make a recommendation to council be before it becomes law. That 30-day time period gives the public an opportunity to chime in. We have short-courted that sometimes when issues <clears throat> we don't believe are going to have um, uh, impacts to the community in any way, shape, or form. There's really no comment needed and or we've got to get a foundation potentially in the ground before freeze up. So those are some of the reasons in the past that we've advanced uh, decisions. Um, Again, I'll keep my personal comments, but that's why we do things to give a 30-day pause for the public before we read it into law. Uh, thank you. I agree with the mayor's position. I think as a matter of principle, we should have that 30-day gap unless there's some exceptional circumstance, and, and I, did, I don't hear there's an exceptional one, but if there is one, I'd certainly consider it. The next item on the agenda is a requested discussion on a application for a water taking uh, permit from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, staff have forwarded to Council for their information and application uh, for a new water taking permit uh, for the Cleveland's House property in Minette. Uh, Councillor Mazan requested that a discussion take place at Committee of the Whole, so staff have placed it on the agenda. Uh, for. Uh, hopefully committee's assistance in uh, helping some discussion I did contact the uh, the ministry to have a discussion on the permit and uh, I guess to put it a, a little bluntly it's it's more so they're notifying us out of courtesy um, 
uh, so that we don't have to consistently uh, observe the environmental bill of registry for new water taking permits and also for in this situation they run into where municipalities are requested for water taking permits for say a golf course use on a property that's not zoned for a golf course yet um, I would say more than asking for our permission per se let's put it that way um, they do have their um, sort of uh, experts that would submit the application and the ministry has their experts that peer review that information. But they uh, are open to comments if there's specific questions or local knowledge of the watershed that we want to forward. They can do their, uh, forward those on to the proponent to address. And also the ministry did offer to do some outreach or education to council at a future meeting if you wished. Unfortunately, the ministry's budget is rather strapped and they would like to do that by video conference, which I'm not sure we're capable of doing yet. But um, they did uh, make that offer. So hopefully that spurs some discussion. I'll do my best to answer any questions. If, if committee wishes to um, make comments to the ministry, we would have to put a resolution on tomorrow's council agenda as I believe the deadline is tomorrow for comments. Through you, thank you. Uh, the purpose of uh, my question was, again, through education. This was our second uh, notification that had come through. And the point that I noticed was, first of all, I wasn't 100% sure how often these things come up. And second of all, it was the second one, and it's a 10-year water-taking period. So I just, from a pure wanting to understand how many of these are happening in our watershed. And is it just a normal practice, which you've just answered that's pretty much the case? I believe on the ministry website there's a map of the existing water taking permits. I think it's in the range of, I could be wrong on the number. Um, I did look it up uh, when this came in, um, at ballpark 20 or so in the municipality. They, they come quite randomly. It is a it is a requirement that they notify the municipality. Um, I happen to be the contact person who gets the email, um, but it's addressed to the municipality, so I do forward it to Council for your information. Uh, most of them are renewals. Uh, this is different in that it's new, um, but I would say, so they, they do come in uh, sort of bunches. You might not get any for a year or two, and then you, you might get a small handful. Uh, but there's about in the range of 20 in the municipality. Uh, through you uh, to staff. I, my question is, um, <clears throat> you said this is new, uh, so my question was going to be, how does this compare to the previous water taking permit they had? But if you're saying it's new, uh, maybe you could just explain what's in place now. And through the chair, t to be honest, I, I can't answer that question. I could look into that. I just am referencing the uh, notification that we received, and it is a new permit. I'm not sure how, if they do not have an existing or how they uh, access the current water. I would have to, that would be a question for the proponent. Uh, thank you. Through you, I guess, to David. David, <clears throat> I believe there's a trigger amount and, and a, a volume of water that necessitates the need for a permit. So I would assume in this particular case, Cleveland Sosa is saying we'd like to remove our brown golf course and make it a green golf course uh, or something along those lines. I'm not sure. But um, I think it's just because of a certain volume because we all take water if we're on the waterfront for the most part. But it doesn't require a permit. That's correct. There is a, uh, a trigger amount uh, for when that permit is required. I believe it's, it's either five or 10,000 liters a day, I believe. 10? 50? 50 is the notification. Of the, well, it's either 5, 10, or 50, and the public works director believes it's 50.
So the next report um, is with respect to uh, finance administration. It is the uh, 2018 Clerk's Department statistics for road closings and license agreements. It's just an annual report we provide for information so that council and committee members are aware of the um, applications received in the past year for road closings and license agreements, the um, amount of application fees that we receive for both, and the amount of land sales and rental agreement fees that we collect. So. Um, if uh, there's any questions, I can answer them. I can tell you that the total amount that will be allocated to the roads reserve, which is part of what our uh, reserve bylaw um, indicates, is that will be uh, close to $200,000, just under, um, to that reserve from 2018. So that's good news. And if there's any questions, I can answer. Yeah, this item is just for information. There's no resolution. It's just um, uh, so committee is aware. I'm just pulling up the, the um, <coughs> short road application. The next item is with respect to a road closing and land exchange proposal for um, Tondran Island in the application's name of Hilliard. We received uh, this request. Uh, the policy does not allow road allowances being closed to water with um, respect to the township of Muskoka Lakes. So one option is to exchange lands. The, the current property owners have a number of encroachments on the road allowance and they have had an existing license agreement. But they um, have recently changed hands amongst the family members and they're wanting to resolve this so that uh, they don't have to have the license agreement in place. And um, staff supportive of this application. I've got on the screen the current road allowance where the encroachments situ are situated, which is in red, and then the proposed um, location of the road allowance to leading to water off, off the connecting road allowance. Uh, the neighbors, we contacted them, and they are supportive of this application and have no objections. And so we are recommending that it be approved. Um, I I think that swapping is a very good idea, but I would just like to inquire along the shoreline of what we currently own, is it uh, comparable to what they are going to suggest we now own? Like, are we going from a beach to a cliff? I just want to make sure that we're going from whatever type of geographic area to the same. Um, it is an improved location, actually. Perfect. Thank you. A portion of the road allowance and the land exchange submitted by the Hilliards, roll number 9-15-03201, subject to the conditions of township policy CLS08 and, and of the June 13, 2019 staff report. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. I should also take a moment to welcome back Terry, who's been off helping out at the district for a while. It's good to have you back around the table. Thank you. Okay. We're just going to jump to the, um, as you can tell, we have to wait till 10 o'clock for our delegations. So the, we're just trying to uh, 
take off uh, care of some of these other issues. We'll go to the minutes of the um, the library. Anyone have any questions or concerns about that? You know who you can look to if you have any. And what's the next one? Sorry, we'll go. Yeah, community events. Anyone have anything to share? Sorry, the Terry Fox Golf Tournament is in Windermere at the Windermere Golf um, Club on Thursday, June the 27th. The tee-off time is 5 o'clock. Uh, it's $70, and you get nine holes of golf, a shared cart, and a barbecue dinner. And of that, $20 goes to the Terry Fox Foundation. And, of course, it's our anniversary this year, our 20th, so we'd like to get as many as possible. And then on Saturday night at 7.30 at the Windermere United Church, there's O Canada, which is a, uh, a selection of, of Canadian songwriter songs uh, and that. And uh, it'll be, it's normally very well attended. And on June the 22nd, from 1 to 4, there's a Strawberry Social at the Windermere uh, Community Center, and that's put on by uh, Christchurch Anglican Church. So, uh, it, and I'll tell you, they're the best strawberries around. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. On the community updates, um, the uh, there's a All Nations uh, Walk Water Walk scheduled for the uh, Skeleton Lake area on <coughs> June the 29th and 30. Um, for the two days because the lake is t the walk is told around the whole lake starting at Saturday morning at 5 a.m. It'll be uh, led by the First Nations um, uh, um, ladies and men. Uh, I put the, the details in everyone's um, mailbox this morning on this and it's the purpose is to bring awareness to the, the, the rights of water and the land and um, looking for uh, support of the community to turn out. So uh, there's uh, lots of information in your mailbox that you can pick up on, and I hope to see uh, some of us there. I know uh, it's a long weekend. <laughs> there's a lot of priorities, but anyways, that's that. In the Milford Bay Community Center, we're going to have um, on the actual holiday, July 1st holiday, we'll have our, the ladies of the community club will have their hot dog and celebration for Canada Day. So that's the announcements for the Milford Bay community. And I got to hear what Milford Bay was up to on CBC Radio today, which was another bonus to have us on national. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll turn this over to Susan because we've both been jointly working on this. So uh, this is actually this was a, a group of, of yeah. people that attend and, and seniors attending dancing. Oh, dancing! Oh, I thought you were talking about uh, something else. <laughs> Susan will talk about um, the community and the meeting that we had the other night and Miss uh, Jenny is in the in the audience. You give it back over to you, yes. <laughs> so so maybe step one, I would like to hear though how we were showcased because that's somewhat exciting to hear. Is it to so on, on CBC this morning they, they uh, commented that a group of people, seniors from Milford Bay, were attending dance classes um, and and all the benefits of that uh, tap was brought up but also a few members that were um, way better off than I am I'll tell you um, being able to do ballet in their 70s was pretty impressive but the fact that um, for me to hear Milford Bay <laughs> you know, on, on, uh, on CBC is always a, a big bonus. So. Uh, I continue to be amazed by the energy in the Milford Bay community. Um, and I thought it was about something else, just very timely in the news with the federal government's initiative towards banning plastics. Uh, very proactively and quietly, I would say, the Milford Bay community has started an initiative for zero waste. And last week, Gordon and I had the opportunity to attend a session 
at the Milford Bay Community Center, not with the intention of changing the world, but understanding what we can do in small ways today to start improving uh, how we, we look at waste and as a whole. And uh, they had a great turnout. They had a speaker come from Bracebridge to talk about zero, what zero waste looks like and some practical tips on how to do it. And I'm happy to say, I think, Ginny, are you here in the audience somewhere? There you are, is uh, come today to listen to the presentation from the district with the intention of let's find ways to lead here in the township of Muskoka Lakes when it comes to protecting the environment but uh, managing our waste. So great job uh, in the Milford Bay Community Center. Um, Walker's Point is starting their children's summer program for July and August and this year it would be it is feathers fins and fur um, also our annual uh, community library barbecue is coming up the first Saturday in July everybody welcome and I'm sure that the counselors will all be receiving invitations I'm gonna suggest that we take oh sorry before the break uh, just two things of uh, note uh, Porter Airlines starts flying on the 27th of June, the inaugural flight, uh, which is good news for those people who uh, want to fly up here. And uh, I know they also have special discounts if you want to get out of Muskoka for the weekend to uh, get on the airplane to go south, which is uh, kind of fun. Um, the other piece of news a little bit, and I know uh, Councillor Kelly is aware of this and some other staff, uh, in the past the mayor's always held a golf tournament to raise money for a local charity. Uh, we're changing that this year. Uh, we'll be sending out a press release at the beginning of the, uh, next week. But we are going to be holding, Muskoka Lakes and myself, a water sport fun day. On Monday, the 1st of July, I know it's going to interfere with the hot dogs, um, but uh, Monday, the 1st of July, from 2 till 5 p.m., we are inviting all of Muskoka. Uh, specifically Muskoka Lakes, but we'll invite anyone else uh, who'd like to join us for an afternoon of water sports fun. But we're going to be raising money in this particular case for flood victims and for Andy's house. So people can buy wristbands, they'll have access to the water park at Clay's for the kids. There'll be bouncy castles, there'll be uh, music, uh, a VIP area. We're trying to get some discounts on some of the shops down at uh, Wallace Marine so that if you have a wristband you get discounts and they in turn will also contribute. Uh, if you want you can go discount water skiing, you can go discount flyboarding. Again all of this will cost some money but it's going to come back into the community uh, which is awesome and then at uh, 730 it will be uh, the Monday night ski show a little bit bigger better again raising money and then at 10 p.m. Uh, fireworks so, which is typically dusk. So those three events, and it's going to be happening Wallace Bay Cleveland's house uh, on the dock. And uh, again, we're inviting all of Muskoka. We'll send out a press release next week. But uh, also in council, everyone obviously is invited. It's at Muskoka Lakes and the mayor event. So welcome to the new golf tournament 2.0. Thank you. Thank um, you. Keep it down back there. <laughs> we don't need a bylaw. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, if we, we'll take a, a quick break. I'll be back by 10, um, and then our delegations can start. Thank you.
Oh, I, you can just give it to me. I'll take them up. Perfect. But you do need one of your own. Perfect. your last name. That's okay, that's what everyone else can Thank you. <laughs> and oh, and I'm sorry. Andrew. Andrew, sorry, thank you. Welcome. We're going to hear your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, present the committee this morning. And we're here to work together with the township on re revisioning the, our solid waste management program in Muskoka. We've now made presentations to the Engineering Public Works Committee. Uh, we've met with uh, Town of Bracebridge, uh, Georgia Bay Township, and we're going to be talking with all the area municipalities in the next um, two weeks. Um, fundamentally, as Canadians, we generate more waste per capita than anybody else in the world. And so there needs to be a fundamental shift in the, in the amount of waste that's um, generated in the first place. And it's really based on the four R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and recover. And when we went to committee uh, in December this year and told them that we, you know, we just built a new landfill three, year, three years ago and now we have to construct the second of nine cells, they were just absolutely astounded by that. And, and so that was a significant driver in, in recognizing that there's a need for change in our waste management program. You know, having approval to have a landfill nowadays in Ontario, it, it's really a rare thing. And so we need to make this landfill last as long as possible. It, it has significant financial and environmental impacts by doing so. And so the path that we're on today in Muskoka and the province, it's really not sustainable. And fortunately, the, the province has recognized that. And we'll be speaking on um, legislation that's in place that will be driving uh, a lot of change. And it's unprecedented, but now the federal government has even got involved this week in the Blue Box program. They, they are going to change the Canadian Environmental Protection Act to eliminate what's called single-use plastics. That is a significant signal that uh, this, this file, waste management, is important to, to the country. And, you know, this is Muskoka, and, and we, we, we recognize that environment is important to us, but the waste file never seems to be associated with environment, and that really needs to fundamentally change. And, and I'm pitching that, you know, we're really um, advocating for a lot of change in this file. And it's going to be painful, but truth, truthfully, it, it's worth it. So let's start with looking at the legislation that's in place. And, and, and most of this was formed or put in place by the Wynn government in 2016. It was unanimously supported by all parties. Uh, the Waste-Free Ontario Act, Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act, 
Waste Diversion Transition Act and Extended Producer Responsibility Act. This legislation is recognized internationally as being the foundation of, of the right principles to uh, address the pro problem. problem. And so, as commissioners, we were all kind of wondering what the Ford government's going to do with the wind legislation. But fortunately, they, they've endorsed it. Now, they've rebranded it, and they've, they've called it to made an Ontario environmental plan. But that's fine. You know, this legislation rem remains in place. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting to see what's called the blue box regulation to see how this, this file, what the extent of producer responsibility um, act, well, how this will unfold. And we'll talk about that in a bit uh, in detail. And... You know, this, this is an Im importance to District Council, and I can acknowledge that uh, Chair Clink, when he addressed the inaugural meeting of, of District Council, he did speak about uh, the importance of addressing the waste file, uh, because the, it's the environment that uh, Muskokans value the most. And he did call for a complete review of the waste file, including a re re review of the bin sites. And I know that committee has been very supportive of, of uh, as well of that uh, objective. So we have all these drivers of change as a reason that um, staff is here to present to you today. So what does this ultimately going to mean for, for Muskoka? Well, I think, I think we're calling for level of service changes. Uh, things have to change from what we're doing today. And there's going to be cost implications of this. And, and I can tell you that if, if we don't change our level of service today, uh, costs will be going through the roof. But if we, if we take action, um, I think we have significant opportunities for cost savings. And uh, I think that's a, an important part of this discussion. It's about environmental and, and fiscal responsibility. Ultimately, um, ha having an effective strategy will reduce our environmental uh, footprint in Muskoka and will extend the landfill. And those are all good things. Um, I just want to show you the Made in Ontario environmental plan. Uh, you know, I think there's some key components to it, preventing and reducing litter, increasing opportunities for Ontario's to, to reduce waste, making producers responsible for their waste, reducing and diverting food and organic waste, recover the value of resources, supporting comp competitive and sustainable end markets, reducing plastic waste, and providing clear rules for compostables. And so all these components uh, are part of our strategy that we're bringing forward today. Uh, the principles, again, we need to re reduce the amount of waste that we're generating to start with, uh, reusing it, recycling it, recovering it, to minimize the, the amount that's ultimately disposed of. If we look at the statistics in Muskoka, um, where we're at, the, the black on your left represents the amount that's landfilled. So that's about two-thirds. Uh, the blue is, of course, the blue box program, and the green is the kitchen organics, uh, an organics diversion. So that should be one-third, one-third, one-third. And so that's in indicative that today we're not where we really should be in, in Muskoka. Uh, th that disposal is double of, of what it really needs to be. And if we look at where the province wants to be in the next 30 years, uh, they're anticipating that uh, disposal will only be 20 percent of the total. Organics and blue box will be 40 percent percent each. So what, what, what we see here in, in this chart, diverting organics is, is one of the opportunities that we need to change in, in the SCOCA as quickly as possible. So let's kind of start going through all these components one by one. So to start with, uh, one of the worst things you can do in a landfill is put kitchen organics into it. So we've all heard about greenhouse gas emissions and and when you put organics in a landfill, it generates methane gas, which is one of the greenhouse gas emissions that con contributes to, to climate change. And it, it also results in what's called leachate. You know, it's that liquid that forms in a landfill that's contaminated the groundwater aquifers, you know, in, in the past. And so um, environmental number one is get the organics out of the landfill. So we do have a green bin program in place in the urban areas throughout Muskoka. But I can tell you that the participation rate is, is relatively no, low. If you drive around on collection day, you'll see not as many green bins out as there should be. And if you look at the green bins and how much there's in there, they should all be full, and they're not. And so why is that? I would say that's because our bag limits are too high, and people have an alternative not to divert waste. They just put organics in, in the, the garbage program. 
And so we really envision extending the green bin service uh, out in, into the, the rural areas of Muskoka. I know Huntsville and Bracebridge are very interested in, in advocating for that. You know, that they'll have budget impacts and we'll, we'll introduce that year after year and see what makes sense. Um, staff also envision that ultimately someday we'll be able to service seasonal roads to a higher degree than we do today. Uh, we're working with our contractor. There's some innovative thinking that we're designing smaller trucks that can actually travel down the, the smaller roads and, and they, they have multi-compartments in them that, um, that which makes that a, a possibility. It's unfortunate, but we don't accept organics at all our transfer stations and, and our depots today, and, and we need to get on that as soon as possible. And we, we cannot accept um, organics at any bin sites, and that's one of the many reasons that we're calling for bin sites have to be eliminated. Um, committees ask us to look at commercial organics to see if there's an opportunity or, or problem in Muskoka. and. Um, you know, so like restaurants and food establishments and hotels, uh, that sort of thing, uh, they're typically serviced by, by the private waste management contractors. I'm not really seeing a, a big issue for, for our landfill or Muskoka today, but I agree that we need to, to look at it further and get a better understanding of whether this is a problem or, or not. Uh, we do foresee making some minor changes where we can accept small amounts of organics at, at, at the buyer's transfer station. Uh, it's very costly to, pr to process organics, uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a big conversation. It's not high on our priority list, but uh, we're here for, for input. If you feel otherwise, we're certainly glad to consider that. Um, so the Blue Box program today, as it is in Ontario and, and throughout the country, it, it fundamentally doesn't work. It, it's neither environmentally um, sustainable or does it, it doesn't make any uh, cost sense. And up until a few years ago, China accepted all plastics and they had an open door pl policy on, on accepting the Blue Box program materials and they suddenly stopped that. And so now there's, there's just no markets, that, 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 like, that there's, there's little money in trying to recover plastics today. Um, one of the problems that we, everybody is dealing with th throughout the country is, is contamination. And, when materials aren't properly se separated between the container stream and the fiber stream and they get to the processing facility, that's problematic. We find that curbside collection works very, very well throughout Muskoka, low contamination rates, a bit higher at transfer stations, and, but, but we, we have some solutions to that. But at, at the bin sites, it, it's out of control. Like 80% of the material at the bin sites, truthfully, is landfilled. It is so contaminated, we spend all this money collecting, you know, uh, recyclable materials at bin sites, and it's unfortunate, but it's, it's so contaminated with garbage, gasoline, you name it, it it's in there. It's, it's, it's a problem. The, the province recognizes that there needs to be a change to the Blue Box program, and what they're doing is they're shifting the responsibility for the entire program on the producers of packaging materials. So today, the the producers are only funding less than 50% of the cost of the Blue Box program. The rest of it is on the taxpayer. And so that's shifting to 100% recovery on, on the producers. This is their problem to deal with. This is their problem to manage. We see that as a step in the right direction. We want to transition Muskoka at the earliest opportunity to free up more than a half a million dollars per year of funding that can really uh, be served for other purposes. Uh, we're waiting to see what this blue box regulation really looks like in, in terms of how this will unfold. Uh, the best information we have is, is in the next three to five years, uh, opportunities will come forward where we can transition uh, away from being responsible for the program. I did mention that our garbage bag limits are, are too high, and that's one of the reasons why we have uh, poor diversion rates. And, so we're, we're calling for, we're recommending that this fall that we reduce all of our bag limits by one across the board. And I, we, we know that it's well established in Ontario and beyond that one bag per limit for even a relatively large household is, is very, very manageable. And you know, the leading municipalities in the province that have diversion rates in the 60 to 70 percent range, they've been doing this for years. We're only at 45 percent and we've installed it for many years. So this is very doable. It'll have a positive impact on, on the landfill. It'll uh, create uh, diversion opportunities. 
And again, uh, we recognize at bin site, there's no, there's no ability to enforce any kind of bag limits at, at, a, at a bin site. So another problem there. One of the options that, that you have, uh, recognizing that with the seasonal population, there's a lot of pushback on the fact that they pay a lot of taxes toward you know, providing a service. They're only up in Muskoka for a limited amount of year. They don't think that's fair. So from the district perspective, area mis every area municipality can decide if, if you want to consider bag tags. And the way that works is, you know, if, if, there's, if you're allowed one bag per week, you know, here's your 52 bags you can use as you see fit. That is a potential solution to the fairness of the, of the service delivery. Um, I can tell you that it's, it's challenging to manage it. It's costly. Um, it's another administrative thing that has to be done. But I think it's one of those tools that I would ask you to consider to see if that's appropriate for, for the township or not. Of course, again, with the unstaffed sites, we don't have the ability to enforce, enforce that. So if we look at best practices throughout the province, the leading municipalities, they've, they have mandatory bylaw, mandatory diversion bylaws in, in place. And that signals the fact that, you know, this is not an optional thing for people to decide if they want to divert or, or not. It signals that this is a mandatory requirement that you as, as councillors have decided is appropriate for Muskoka. And so um, we want to put this forward uh, next year um, illegal dumping is, is a big, big problem in Muskoka. Uh, this is one of the things that will be addressed in the bylaw. Our challenge at district is we don't have bylaw departments, we don't have bylaw of officials. Does it really make sense for us to have that duplicated level of service? I would think not. Uh, I would think it would make sense. We're, we'd like to have discussion with all the area municipalities. You know, can, do you have the ability to enforce the, the district's bylaw? Um, for solid waste. I think that would make a lot of sense and, and we, we could work out the details but you know we're here to, to make that recommendation. Okay now coming to my favorite part of the presentation, bin sites. So you know I think there's two really really important things you need to know. One is, is they are illegal. Um, we, we have met with the ministry and the ministry has a high respect for for, for the district and, and its area municipalities in terms of its environmental stewardship. And they've been, they've more or less told us that, you know, they're looking for voluntary compliance on our part to deal with this. Otherwise, they would have, they would have to uh, enforce compliance. So I am meeting with them this afternoon in Barrie. They're looking for an update on, you know, what our timeline is. But they, they are illegal. There is no way that we can get a, a permit or an ECA to have a bin site in Muskoka. And so I think, I think you've seen throughout the presentation that there isn't any component of our waste management strategy that we can actually make work with a bin site. We can enforce bag limits. We can implement the green bin program. Uh, contamination of recyclables is, is it's out of control. Illegal dumping is unmanageable, and like we have 12 students that go around all summer, and all they do is clean up the, the bin sites. And you know, they say to me, they said, you know, really, uh, we, we appreciate the work, but really, is is that the right answer for <laughs> for the district to to be doing that? <laughs> and the use of bin sites by ineligible residents, I think, is another significant thing that you should be aware of. Let's look at the marinas, for example. So marina service boaters, and some of those boaters are taxpayers from Muskoka, but many of them are, aren't. So, you know, we're, we're providing a service with, with, with tax, tax money to subsidize the operation of a marina for people that aren't eligible to use that service in Muskoka. Even the marinas use our bin sites, and, and that shouldn't be funded by the taxpayer either. So marinas have the opportunity to apply for their own ECA, ECA from the ministry to operate their own waste disposal operation. They have to follow whatever rules the ministry puts forward. It, it's not that there won't be waste disposal at marinas, but they have to apply for that. That can't be a municipal service going forward. 
And if, if we look at, if we drill down to the cost of, uh, of operating bin sites and compare it to all the other alternative service deliveries, it's over a million dollars a year. It's the most ineffective use of, of public money to manage waste. It's environmentally ir irresponsible and, you know, we feel it's not reflective of Muskoka. So it, they're illegal, they don't work. I'm here to say that we need to phase them out within three years. We need to find out a solution to, to make that, that work. And we'll talk about public consultation in a minute. So what do we do if we don't provide bin sites for, for Muskokans? Well, there's fundamentally four options. Uh, we can extend the curbside collection. Um, that is the most effective waste met met methodology that we have in place. Uh, we've looked at that for, for Muskoka Lakes. We, we don't think there's any like, like easy, low-hanging fruit to do that. Um, we could build another transfer station in, in Muskoka. We have Evely, a very, very busy, it's our busiest site in Muskoka. Um, didn't come up with that as a recommended op option, and we'll, we'll go through what we are recommending. So waste depots are another um, potential solution that might work for the township. You know, uh, now waste depot is, you know, basically you, you have bins, but they're in a fenced area. You know, they're on, typically on a concrete or asphalt pad. Uh, the ministry does uh, license them. You have to have a set of rules to go with them. But we would staff them, and we would have scheduled hours of operation. Any unstaffed site is is, is a recipe for illegal dumping, and it's just problematic for making our program work. So all existing waste depots in Muskoka, we're putting forward in our budget that we want to staff them and have scheduled hours. And the fourth operation, uh, uh, Opportunity is simply to redirect residents um, in places where there, you know, there's a transfer station or, or, or waste depot nearby uh, within a reasonable travel, traveling distance. I would say 15 minutes, 10 kilometers. You know, that's not unreasonable, at least compared to other parts of Muskoka where people are asked to drive a certain distance to, to dispose of their waste. Um, so Georgian Bay and Muskoka Lakes have have the highest number of bin sites, um, you know, 22, 23. And so, you know, we're putting forward that that, that has to change. Um, difficult to see, but um, you'll have access to this presentation where you can see where all the bin sites in the township are, are currently located. And I'd like to speak on the alternatives that, that staff have really brought forward for your consideration. And I would preface that by saying we could provide whatever service level the township uh, decides. It's, it's really your, your decision at the end of the day in terms of what you'd like to see. Um, if we look at the 169 area in, in West Muskoka, we see one, two, three, we see five bin site locations that are within 10 kilometers of the tower transfer station. And all and people have to drive out that way anyways. And so, I mean, that would be low-hanging fruit that could be a potential alternative for your consideration. Um, looking at South Muskoka, um, we have a number of marinas situated around the, the Torrance and Walkers Point area. Uh, there's two, two obvious sites for, for waste depots. One is in the Torrance area. There's township lands that uh, could be used for that purpose. Also, in the Walkers Point area, there's... Um, m and R lands that are available. We, waste depots have to be situated on, on public lands. That, that's one of the ministry's requirements. So, I mean, those are alternatives that are within reasonable travel distances for argument's sake. Um, in East Muskoka, um, we, we see the Evely transfer station being relatively close to the Beaumont Bomeris Yacht Club, we see Rose Warren on the other side being close to Pine Island. Um, to the north area, we could potentially site a waste depot on Township of Muskoka Lands to serve as Parker's Landing and the, the Troy Cove Marina. You know, those, those are alternatives. Um, and for North Muskoka, um, on Peninsula Road, District of Muskoka has some lands that again, are on a route that people have to travel on, on their way back home where we could situate a waste depot there. 
And waste depots are relatively inexpensive to build and to operate. I would say, you know, $50,000 on the high side to build, uh, $50,000 a year to staff on the high side. Um, and we'll talk about potential uh, saving opportunities where those, you know, that could fund those, um, those changes. So I would like Quinn to come up to speak to this. Uh, we, we recognize the importance of having this entire conversation with the public. You know, it, it's, it's, it's been very challenging in, in previous years the district to change its program. Why? Because we haven't been able to convince the public of the need to do it. But Quinn can do it, trust me. <laughs> So thank you. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, with all of this information presented, it is very controversial. Uh, the public is going to be very much affected by these changes if they are rolled out. And I wanted council, committee, and of course residents of Muskoka Lakes to know that there will be public engagement with these changes. Um, with our engagement plan, we essentially want to know what are the barriers to participation, what are the problems that every resident is having, seasonal road residents, permanent road residents, water access residents, what do they want, what do they need, and what do they expect. Um, if anybody has been um, paying attention to what we're doing in Huntsville right now, we are um, undertaking a, a downtown reconstruction, uh, and we've uh, started a site called engagemuskoka.ca which is, uh, it's hosted by Bang the Table, which is a community engagement company. Um, and we can post forums and surveys, everything on this website, which we have found to be very helpful for the residents of Huntsville. And we'd like to roll that out in different aspects of community engagement for the District of Muskoka. So this is a way for a one-stop shop for everybody to come to a website, as opposed to mail outs or as opposed to public meetings. We know that everybody's not going to be att attending, but we want everybody's input. So our plan is to use the Engage Muskoka website to garner some information to foster these changes is to, and to make recommendations. So some of these things that people might be wondering is the effectiveness of our mobile app. I'm not sure if everybody has downloaded that yet, but Muskoka Recycles on the, um, on the App Store. If you download that, there's a waste wizard, there's access to your collection day. So we're looking at expanding that, um, that current uh, vehicle that we have for media. What do water access properties expect? What do they need? And what's going to be convenient for them? So those are informa that's information that we can get off of this as well. Um, for water access properties, again, right now we have everybody set up at marinas. That's typically the disposal location. We want to present options that are going to be convenient to water access properties, but also that are environmentally feasible. We're not going to present an option to them that's not necessarily possible. We also want to use this as an education tool. We want to talk to them about these new bills that are coming down the line, this new legislation, and the way Ontario is moving. This is not made to be an inconvenience for residents. It's made to, for us to kind of leapfrog, leapfrog forward. We're trying to catch up to where everybody is right now in the province, but we also want to get ahead of it as well, so just to reduce the amount of changes coming forward. Uh, we want to review the hours of operation at our transfer stations, uh, make sure that, uh, the, uh, and as well as the staffing. We know everybody's been to the Evely transfer station before and um, experienced the lineups that are associated with uh, busy times of day. Um, as Fred mentioned as well, we're going to review the hours of operation of waste depots. Through these surveys, through these forums, through these things on our, or our community engagement website, we can find out when is the ideal time that people are needing and wanting to dispose of their waste. Do we need to stay open until 10 o'clock on Sunday evenings? Possibly, and that's what we're going to get that information from residents on this site, hopefully. Um, green bin program, the expansion of the green bin program, how are we going to make it work for residents who are not necessarily home on collection day? Uh, people are worried about animal encounters. They do have roadside bins. Possibly the feasibility of changing a collection day to Monday has been discussed right after the weekend for um, increased seasonal residents in, in local municipalities. So these are options that we can kind of throw out there and get everybody's feedback on, and that's essentially what we're looking at. Um, bag tag logistics. We talked about bag tag logistics. We want to know how people feel about those. Um, there's also the point that uh, someone brought up in a previous committee that how does that support our environmental efforts if someone's left with 40 bag tags and they just need to get rid of them? Are they just going to kind of 
put everything in a bag and put it out at the curb? Should we put a limit on the amount of bag tags? So these are the conversations that are coming um, forward from residents as well who are concerned about these initiatives that we're putting forward. Um, again, phasing out bin sites in three years, it is going to be a tough decision. It's going to be um, very controversial. We're going to receive increased phone calls and concerns, but education is key. We may be removing away a service, but we want to implement another service to service these people better, more conveniently, and have some less frustration with disposal. So we may be re removing something, but we're going to add increased service delivery and other aspects that may be more manageable to increase our waste diversion targets. Uh, but know that these decisions are going to be made with public input, council committee, residents, seasonal residents, permanent residents, and we want to make sure that we get the feedback from everybody, not just who can attend public meetings. So um, if anyone has any questions, I will be here. Otherwise, back to Fred. Thank you, Quinn. Oh, um, so I've thrown an awful lot of information at you for the last 30 minutes. I just want to do a quick recap. Um, we see the need to implement a mandatory diversion bylaw, and we need to enforce it. We're calling upon um, support from all the municipalities to use your bylaw departments to enforce our, our bylaw. Um, we're recommending that uh, organics be one of the key focuses in, in diversion for environmental and cost reasons. It's one third of the waste stream, which means we can make the, the landfill last one third longer. Um, currently, the landfill's scheduled for about 20 year life. I think we can get 30 years out of it. Um, we need to have a look at commercial organics and, and see if, if this is, there's a need for that, uh, for addressing that. It's currently addressed by the, the private sector. Uh, transitioning the blue box program to the producers that are responsible for generating the packaging materials, uh, a big priority, uh, recommending to committee that we do that at the earliest opportunity. Uh, reducing our weekly garbage bag limits by one, um, introducing that this fall and, and making that effective next year. Exploring whether a bag tag program is, is uh, an appropriate answer for this, mis uh, for this municipality. Uh, phasing out the on-staff bin sites because it's a, it's a regulatory requirement and it, it doesn't fit with our waste management program. Uh, we're here to consult with you in, in terms of whether this program makes sense to you. Um, Quinn just spoke on the, the importance and, and rolling out our community engagement plan. And, and I've really seen the district evolve in the last number of years and making this a priority. You know, we have some tough infrastructure projects and uh, I, I, I see it that it's, it's a really a key to success. Uh, we do want to consult with the public, as Quinn has said, you know, the, there's the service level impacts and there's always sensitivities. People need to understand why this is happening. Um, you know, ultimately, we'll be going back to district council, you know, based on the, all the input of the public and the area municipalities, and they will make whatever decision they'll make. And we'll introduce those changes in, in the coming years. Um, I won't go through this. This basically graphically describes the, the, the process. You know, we're, we're driven by provincial and now federal um, dr drivers of change, as well as the district's need to uh, um, address this issue. And this will result in review of our waste management program. I do want to have some high-level um, discussion on, on how the levy works and how costs are allocated to the area municipalities. And every, every area municipality has a different program, and so that every area municipality has a different cost that it's assigned to it. You know, the, the, the fixed portions of operating uh, the solid waste department, those are allocated to the areas proportionate with your population, proportionate with the number of service people that we have. Um, we, we, to be fair to every area municipality, you know, trucks are going driving all over Muskoka to collect waste. We, we weigh the, the average cost so that the, the townships that are furthest away from the, the landfill are not disadvantaged by the, the location of the landfill being in Bracebridge. Everybody pays a, a, a weighted cost so that it's fair. It, it's fair between Bracebridge and uh, Georgian Bay Township and, and Lake of Bays, which are you know, extreme distances to, to the landfill. Um, I wanted you to have a sense of, of how costs vary in Muskoka. And so this is in, in the, the district uh, treasurer's uh, budget binder. 
Uh, it shows a breakdown of what whatever your area municipality pays for curbside, what's called non-curbside, which is your transfer stations and your bin sites, and disposal and diversion, which is you know processing costs, the recycling facility, and landfilling costs. And so at the low end of the scale, Lake of Bays has their cost per unit is a hundred dollars per serviced um, resident. At the other end of the scale is Georgian Bay at $179. And the Township of Muskoka is somewhat in the middle. Um, you're at, where are you, $147. And I could tell you you would be among the highest. Um, the key thing that offsets your costs is the Evely Transfer Station generates significant revenue. There's more revenue generated at, at that station than anywhere else in Muskoka. Um, there are opportunities, uh, like the, the curbside program I would suggest is it's a cost effective service. Um, your opportunities are in eliminating the bin sites. By eliminating the, the ineligible residents and the illegal dumping, the whole disposal, the, um, the amount that we're disposing and the amount that we're processing, those costs are going to come down. And you know, there, there's a lot of drivers of, a lot of pressures to increase costs in waste management. I have a report coming to committee next Wednesday. Our processing costs are going up 20%, and that's since last fall. And, and so it's, this money has to come somewhere to offset these in, increasing costs. Um, I would put forward that we need to do a, a more robust financial analysis, but I think there's the opportunity not only to avoid increasing taxes, I think potentially, depending on what service delivery uh, the township decides is, is appropriate, I think there's opportunities for savings, tr truthfully. And, you know, th this whole presentation has been about environment, fiscal responsibility, and I thank you for your time, and we're here to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Some of you may know that um, uh, my kid was one of those kids. They got to do the um, kids. He was 18 at the time, but boy, oh boy, did he have lots of opinions about what he was doing. And in particular, his route was that uh, 169 Georgian Bay uh, dump sites. And to have someone of that age come back with some great ideas, um, I think we should listen to our youth a little bit more. Uh, but it was it was actually really disgusting to him uh, about what people dump and and who they expect to clean it up, you know, honestly. Um, and so I, I really do hope that we can move forward with with some of these initiatives. I just quickly wanted to ask a, a, a couple of questions, if I could. Um, diapers. The reason why I bring up diapers is because that's usually what I hear from from um, younger families and now the other end. Um, and that seems to be a challenge for people and I just wonder if that could be a small, small discussion. Absolutely. It's a great idea. We've discussed this in, in staff as we reduce the bag limits. Uh, it, it's a reasonable alternative to like, like set out your, your diapers separately and that wouldn't be taken into account in, in the bag limit. And there's a lot of municipalities that do that. I, I know that we would we would support that that initiative as well. A huge issue, of course. Uh, I certainly would, uh, through the district, appreciate. Um, I, I certainly do understand Huntsville and Bracebridge and Gravenhurst. But you know, the township of Muskoka Lakes is is very much a rural environment. You know, our biggest center is Port Carlick, if you will, or Bala. Um, I, do, I do think that we must be very sensitive as a council to our, our particular environment. And I think that's very, I think it's just huge. And when I see us contemplating, you know, one less bag, you know, we have a situation where we are, and which is the township, where there's garbage cans on every, at, at the end of the road. And people put all their garbage. I go out there and there's five bags of garbage in my garbage bag, my, my garbage bin. Point being is that, um, you know, again, we talk about enforcement, policing, if you will. You know, we have to be really aware that, that we need to handle that garbage. 
like the LCBO, you can take your empties back, you get money, this is this a great system. But as it relates to the money we pay to the district to handle the, the taxpayers that elected me said to me, you know, what do we, you know, we pump the water out of the lake for our septic system, which is on our property, and so we get garbage pickup. That's what we get from, that's what we get for 56%. So I, I think that this is a really big issue and I think that we need to, as a council, distill and ourselves as a group really look at this issue and take the, the time it takes to, before we go to one less bag, I mean, I love the challenge, I, I understand it, I get it, but this is bigger than that, it, to my mind. Thank you, I'm gonna start on this end, just cause we're, this is where our first hands were going up, so Pete, if you could. Uh, thank you, through you, uh, great presentation, clearly we need to do something, but to echo Councillor Zavitz, the something, you know, the, the success of this depends on how we approach it, uh, just a few random thoughts. Uh, actually, a quick question. You mentioned the Everly Road uh, transfer station generates all sorts of revenue, and I'm curious about its revenue source. Tipping fees through the chair. Um, but tipping fees from outside of the township? No, no that would be your, your residents, your contractors that are disposing of waste. Uh, you know, there, there is a so, rate schedule for... But it's for, just really a different way that I pay for the service of the transfer station. We all pay for it, I mean, not just me. I mean, I, I just wanted to make yeah. sure I understood uh, if we were running a commercial operation for profit or whether we're reclassifying what I pay when I drive up with a dump truck full of wood as revenue when really it's just me getting, just paying to get stuff taken to the garbage or to the dump, right? Uh, through, through the chair, it, it's a user pay based system. I mean, your, your, your taxes, your cover the you know the, the basis for your entitlement of, of bag limits and, and collection service and when you see those limits depending on what, what you're bringing in whether it's tires brush or um, you know construction waste you know those are subject to tipping fees uh, you know in the township there's significant uh, construction material as an example you know there's just a lot of construction um, activity that goes on and you know, as, as demolition takes place, that has to go somewhere, so, you know. And I don't begrudge paying it. I pay it all the time. I just misunderstood when you called it revenue. I thought okay. perhaps we were billing outside of the tax base oh, no, uh, sure. for, for dumping fees or something. No. Okay. Um, just, sorry, and I don't want to repeat what, uh, what Councillor Zavitz said, but, uh, you know, reducing one bag, I'm both a cottager and a local, the bag limit in town is great, except when I exceed it and I store the bag in the garage until the next week. Uh, we've got vermin, we've got, uh, you know, animals. We, it's a little different environment than the city. But I think one of the key things to getting compliance is, is understanding what most of the seasonal residents do you know, at their permanent residence because it's probably a lot more restrictive than what you're already proposing here. And if they understand that they still have some liberties, uh, it, it may be a much easier sell than it is uh, if you just pull it out of the blue and people feel hard done by you somehow. The only problem is as we make this more what I would call DIY, people are going to expect cost takeouts. And uh, they may or may not be there, but that'll be the kind of feedback we have to anticipate as we roll this thing out to the public. That's it, thank you. Um, through the chair, just a couple of general comments. I, I, I know that our district chairman is very supportive of hearing from the area municipalities because you're all different. You all have very different needs. And, and so that's why we're here is to, you know, ultimately we, we think that programs will be, will be different in different parts of Muskoka. Um, it, it's, it just, never ceases to amaze me that people that are subject to a set of rules on the city, they seem to forget them when they get here. And they don't think that, you know, that they should apply. And, you know, there isn't any, anything that, that we haven't heard before. And, you know, I can tell you as staff, we work very, very hard to reduce the cost of service delivery. I just see nothing but waste, and pardon the pun, in, in the service delivery that we have for solid waste. And, yeah, there's going to be some some pain. I, I, I think I think Quinn said it best. And like when, when people really people are smart. They're you know they need to be informed on the problem. They think that waste just disappears and they you know they don't really aren't aware of what what impacts that has. 
you know, I, I think there's opportunities to save money. I, I've said that, and, and I, I think that has to be part of the messaging. And I think that would be a really great sell if not only there would be good environmental outcomes, but we can demonstrate to people that, um, you know, we've delivered, we've changed level of service, but, you know, it, it's had a, a positive financial outcome. I'm one of the councillors sitting around the table that has experience with the winter bins. And it is challenging just to take your ordinary garbage out there because they are filled uh, with construction material. So getting rid of the bins is probably the best thing that you could do because I don't see that enforcement is going to help at all. Um, with the bags, one bag a week, I have no problem with that. Um, I would make a suggestion. There are there are people that uh, you know, they're having a party at your house. I'm going to have more garbage. Fine, go in, purchase a tunia bag. Have a little sticker. There's my one bag that I pay for with my taxes, and here's my extra ones that I've got my sticker on. So they're paying for that privilege of having extra garbage. Uh, education, I think, is going to be the biggest part. If you can educate people as to why you're doing what you're doing, and how it will be cost effective, and how it will affect their affect their tax bill. I think that they will be, some people, most people will be very compliant and actually very supportive of the system. Thank you. Uh, yes, through you. Uh, I've been here for a number of years and uh, we adopted the principle, I'm in a rural area, uh, that uh, we don't use a bin, we take all of everything to a transfer site. And I think that's the best solution because if you're in a rural area, bins cause problems. P other people put stuff in them, animals love them. And if you've got a conveniently located transfer site or station, I think that's the easiest. The, the one issue with it is uh, Everly's great, except the, the hours are, are a problem. They don't open until 11 o'clock on a Sunday. Uh, you know, they don't close late, so there are issues there. But I think it has to be much more cost effective. We all drive by these sites all the time. To, to, to have that uh, type. Now, the city or the urban areas, that, that's a different issue. You, you can effectively collect there. I'm on Riverdale Road. There's a, approximately 70 properties there, and the bins are just a mess. So. Councillor Javibix uh, just said, full support of that. I want to applaud you on an excellent presentation and forethought not decisions, but giving us food for thought. Yeah. And I, I applaud you for bringing up the point that the waste valve um, does not address the environment. The one thing we haven't talked about, and, and now I think I've got a little background from, your, uh, from one of your question, answers, is that the reason the tipping charges are so significant is there are a number, and I'll underline number of contractors picking up garbage from islands and from shorelines with barges and those those garbage and, and I've talked to contractors have seen it and know it they're being dumped on the barge the uh, liquid from those are going into our lakes then they're taking them to a location they're loading that and then going to the fill site and paying because the people that are hiring them have the wherewithal a tag is not going to stop them they can just hire someone else so you got to look at that um, I was with the region appeal in property management, uh, I suggest you talk to them. We, uh, I was a property manager for seven, uh, 7250 Euron, um, uh, Euron, Euron, Ontario, a large, large uh, uh, government office building, and we had a garbage audit. So we started with the governments, first of all, with, the, with our buildings, and we had a uh, professional come in and tear apart all the garbage that was put out by employees of the region. So we first of all educated ourselves. So you might want to talk to them. I think there was a plan then to move that to um, commercial, that same type. So prototype it with them. Um, the the clear garbage bags or purchase of garbage bags rather than the Canadian Tire bags, which will be a more heavier duty bag from the district would 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 help maybe a little bit. Um, so rather than I mean, you go with the tags, but the tags are not going to address our greater population. It'll hit the seat with seasons. We'll pay the tags. Uh, the the the. I like the idea of the of the remembering the bins, and I can give you one uh, offline, which we should remove this year, because. <laughs> but I know that it just when it it just gets loaded with building material, and it's disgusting. I'm saying, 
it's got to stop. So thank you. Thanks, Mr. Gorman. Thanks, Fred, uh, and thanks, uh, Michael, John, um, Andrew, and Rick Quinn for coming. Uh, appreciate it. It's a tough problem, and, and I get Councillor Zavitt's perspective that we have a number of ratepayers who pay a lot of money, and perception is they don't get a lot of services. Um, I will say I don't think there's too many people around Muskoka who probably couldn't drive their Porsche to their cottage, go try and drive around Halliburton or another place. Uh, we truly have some of the best roads, or try and drive downtown Toronto for that matter, and let the uh, potholes eat you up. Um, so uh, we, we do have a number of uh, programs and services that are operated by the district where our tax dollars do go and do support. So, uh, and, and maybe there's a bigger process, and, and I'll look to uh, Chair Clink at this as we move forward, or even Mr. Dubin. Um, that maybe we at times need to do a better job of where tax dollars that go to the district, how they impact Muskoka Lakes, um, because they do. We all use services. There's not a person around this table, whether you're permanent or not, that doesn't go to at times a sportsplex at times in Bracebridge or use some of the infrastructure that's sitting there, and ultimately that does have a cost, so that we need to do it. And um, so. We need to do a far better job. Quinn, I think the, the number you used at one point is that we have on average a year, in graphic terms, 60 elephants. Am I wrong? 60? We have an extra full-size elephants, 60, going into our landfills that shouldn't be there. Um, and again, I think the last cell was a little over $3 million to open costs. These are fully engineered. They're basically a swimming pool that we're filling up that nothing gets out of, but it's huge, huge money. And and yes, everyone on our committee was shocked when we found out, you know, we just opened this thing and cut the ribbon and this massive cell one is now full. And we're on to cell two. And and we hoped three years ago that it was going to be the thirty year and, and now we're struggling to get to the twenty year. So we really need to make some significant changes. And uh, as much as grumbling and complaining, I'm guilty of it as well. And I will say this. What I sometimes put in my solid bag, because nobody looks at it, it's a little bit more convenient for me to put some stuff in there to separate, to keep out my watermelon rinds or to do whatever that fill up and are ultimately going in our landfills. So I. I Concur with Councillor Roberts, and I told this to Fred before. We need to think about clear garbage bags, and we need to be able to tell people that's inappropriate with what's in that bag. That in itself may solve some of our long-term issues. Um, I, I like the various service level delivery. If we want to Muskoka Lakes Field, we want to buy some bag tags. We we can look at those kind of things, but we really need to look long and hard. Um, I will say from a bin site perspective, if I'm a seasonal resident, I'm up here for the weekend, I'm now loading up my car and driving home, and I've got to drive three or four kilometers with my luggage and whatever I've got, and now I've got a potentially stinky garbage bag sitting beside me. It's not as convenient as Councillor Jaguitz, who lives here year-round and does a garbage run once a week. We typically, if you have curbside pickup, you take it to the end of your driveway. Maybe it's a long drive, maybe it's a little bit, but you can do that quick run before you have to load your car. So when we talk about marina access and those people who are coming from islands, I get in my boat, I can separate my luggage, my clothes, and the garbage. It's nice to separate it at the marina. So I, I, I'd like to really find a better, because I think that's the end of the curb or the end of the drive when they get to shore versus now loading all that again in the trunk of my car and having to take it. So I, I don't have the answer, but I'm just thinking out loud as best we can in that. Um, and the other one thing, you know, and again, uh, Councillor Kelly talked about it. I, I think we all need to think about also two things. You know, we can go buy a $50,000 car and we say, I've paid. I've paid a bunch of money for this thing. But we also know that if we don't maintain it, if we don't put some added cost and change in the oil, that in two years, three years, I need a new engine. And it's going to cost me even more money. 
And I think that's the message we really start need to communicate to people, that if we don't change our practices today, we're going to be three or four or five X in our solid waste disposal costs 10 years and 20 years from now. So we need to start today to do a better job. The other thing, and uh, Ruth mentioned it, and I think it's key, and I'll look to Quinn and to Fred in this, as we do public consultation, we should really consider a youth engagement committee. Yes, yes, yes. They are going to be the future. And if we can get Junior to influence mom and dad, we need to be told how to do things better. So I, I support that. <laughs> They're far better. So, so I will say, you talk about diapers. My, my son, I think it was his girlfriend's response, but they are not doing disposable diapers. I think she takes a steel straw wherever she goes. It's a lot of work. <laughs> but, but I'm saying the youth today have a better handle on where we need to go. And we really need to use them as our poster child. So those are my comments. So thank you. It, it's going to be a difficult year and a half, but we need to get there. Thank you. I, I echo a lot of the comments, so I don't want to take up too much time other than to say thank you. And obviously our service levels, thank you for the, the, the information. Uh, whether we agree with certain things or not, to, at least from my perspective, this is the uh, a foundation for us to now determine what is the appropriate service levels. And what I'm hearing is that um, we will have that appropriate voice t for the different audiences that make up the Township of Muskoka Lakes. It is unique. I concur with my colleagues sitting beside me, uh, Councillor Zavitz. And, uh, you know, if you have a car full of garbage at the end of your weekend and that's your last time leaving Muskoka, thought these are real considerations. So I think really understanding and taking the time to understand each of these audiences. And I think, uh, again, I'm echoing the comments from many but other uh, people, but the, the rollout of this and the education of this will be critical for buy-in. And I think Councillor uh, Kelly had mentioned that as well. So, um, you know, before coming out possibly with the statement of uh, we're reducing by one bag, even sh thinking about language to say we are in, we are looking to improve our service offering to the residents of the township in Muskoka Lakes, and here are some ideas. It's just it, it just immediately kind of gets you on your heels, which is perhaps some of the reaction. Not to say it's not the right solution. I don't know. I'm not the expert, but uh, it just was. It gets you on your heels initially. So, but thank you very much. I, I feel like the flexibility is here and we will determine what we think is appropriate. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's excellent uh, presentation and it gives us some, some things to think about. Uh, one of the things that we maybe should be looking at too is incinerating garbage. And that this is something that uh, they've been doing in Europe and everything else like that. And you know, they say, well, it's extra pollution. When Toronto was taking truckloads to, to Michigan and, and dumping it, if you take the pollution of all those trucks and everything else like that, it, it, it probably is less burning it than, than running it that way. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of people dumping. And, you know, as a property owner that, that uh, has, has people dump things on, they've got to then take it to a landfill, pay to, to, to get it. There should be some way that they can, they can call take pictures or have a bylaw officer out that it's removed and they don't they aren't charged for it because it's not fair to the the property owner if somebody is is dumping and i know in in halton hills when they brought in uh, i think it was two bags and everything else like that they were going on on open road allowances and and the dumping it was costing more uh you know I, I don't know the answer fred but it is a real problem we have to do something with it but we should be looking at uh some alternative methods as well because uh i know atlanta and this was in the 80s were actually burning garbage and when they built the plant they got their garbage and after so many years they were paying them 25 dollars a ton for the garbage for the garbage so they were getting off coal and other fuels so you know it, it does make some sense as far as saving landfill Uh, 
Um, so, yes, thank you for the presentation. And I echo a lot of the comments, and particularly Councillor Edwards, in terms of incineration, because it's my understanding the process, it comes out clean. <clears throat> You're not doing any pollution. So I think that would be something to look at. Um, and to me, a picture's worth a thousand words. So when you get your website up and going with this, Quinn, that graph that shows how bad we are here, I think that would have a huge, huge impact. And um, I, I, I um, contribute a lot to Evely Transfer Station with all the stuff I bring in. <laughs> Well, my only other comment on that, which is personal, is if you could have two people working it when it's really busy, it would be really nice because yeah. the person having to go back and forth, I was 20 minutes waiting the other day, which was fine, but I don't know if you can change that or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I thought it was important, this particular uh, delegation, to allow uh, all council members to, to have a discussion. I did want to add my... Uh, my sister has owned a property in, in Lake Bays for 40 years, and they have historically always had to go and take their garbage to um, to their bin state or not not a bin, sorry, to the the, the, the transfer station. Never a complaint. I'll just say, the, and all of us that have used that cottage load up all the garbage and take. So, I think that that is not such a hardship. And and again. Um, I'm often, if I'm going through Port Carling, you get an opportunity to dump stuff. You go through Gravenhurst, you got an opportunity to dump. Like, there's lots of easy op opportunities uh, to do things. But what I would like to ask, and I'll, I'll look to um, our mayor and our CAO, is that if this issue could be brought forward to uh, a committee meeting of our own, um, because I believe that some of the issues that have been raised actually should be dealt with in our own municipality, that we shouldn't be looking towards district for some of our concerns, like the illegal dumping that Alan mentioned and things. We should be finding ways that we should be dealing with that ourselves, whether through bylaw or, or however. Um, so I hope that we can have a further discussion and actually bring some direction to district much sooner than later. Uh, and, and I think that's an important thing that we could be looking forward to. Yes, David. Thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> it seems to me, uh, and Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, when you talked about illegal dumping, that's in bins rather than roadside. But if that's something that committee or council wishes to go down that road, pardon the pun, then we can explore that. But one question I, I sort of had um, was with respect to the chair's question is I'm assuming this is the initial conversation. And so there's going to be opportunities perhaps through the community engagement plan for further touch points with respect to findings with committee uh, staff, et cetera, going forward with questions like bylaw enforcement and options on other matters as well. Is that a fair? Yeah, first of all, I'll just respond to legal dumping. Illegal dumping, whether it's at a bin site or the side of the road, that's still illegal dumping. Okay. Uh, that needs to be addressed. And I hear a lot that people are afraid to make changes to waste management program because they're afraid of legal dumping. I, I think that would be the wrong approach. I mean, um, make the right decision on what, what the appropriate waste management program is for Muskoka and deal with the illegal dump, dumpers because we cannot, we can tra track them down and they need to be, uh, you know, pay for their consequences. Um, you're right. We, I, I do want to have more discussions directly with, with staff. Um, we do have the public engagement. Um, ultimately, we, we want to receive a resolution from the township on, on, on what its um, direction they want to head for, for district council's consideration. So, uh, we, you know, the timing of that, we, we, we need to still land that. This is an important file, and we need to act quickly. Or, you know, we could, if we deliberate this for years, it will be at our disadvantage. Um, so if we can have something in place by the end of summer to, you know, have heard from the township in all areas, uh, you know, I, I think we want to reflect this in our budget program next year if there's any financial implications, both uh, positive and negative. So, yeah, we, we can work directly to fine-tune the um, steps forward there. Thank you very much. And, again, mostly folks in the audience, our Muskoka Lakes is the place of beauty and, and our mission statement has been to protect our um, environment and, and I think that 
we need to be leaders as opposed to followers if we can. So um, thank you, and we'll have our next speaker come up. And thank you, and we really appreciate your comments. Thank, thank you. you. Who is bringing this forward? Like this, do we have a staff member? Good morning. My name is Vaughn Quinton. Oh, okay. 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 Go ahead. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry. Um, could you just say that again, please? I think from the next action steps from this, uh, and though Fred's gone, John's still here, um, what we need to do is specifically um, have our staff engage with public works staff from a community engagement perspective, find out the rollout and timing, so hopefully some of that, and we'll put it on our future general committee agenda item. Uh, and it may stay on there for a little while as we continue to get information in. Uh, I would hate to make any decisions on our own right now, independent of public input. Uh, I do understand if, if bylaw enforcement is an issue, maybe we do need to increase our fine structure along the way. And again, I think we can direct staff accordingly after that general committee meeting that says, you know, what is our our bylaw, what are we what are we charging people? You know, illegal is going to happen, you know, but let's try and uh, increase potentially some penalties should someone decide to leave an old boat at the end of a road allowance, which has happened in the past. I also um, missed the opportunity to speak uh, on one issue that we're going to be de dealing with today, but I'm going to bring this forward um, because Chair Clink's still in the room. So we are bringing a resolution forward tomorrow to deal with the dumping issue that we have on a, a um, on provincial lands, but basically the Torrance Barrens, which is a shared uh, site in in uh, both Gravenhurst and Muskoka Lakes, and um, we're hoping that this can be brought forward to district as soon as possible because we're into the season already. Uh, and again, it's dealing with that garbage that is, is left on um, basically hiking and camping grounds. So I'm, I'll leave that for now and we'll go to our next delegation. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Vaughn Quinton and I have with me today uh, Robert Club, who is our priest in charge of Christchurch Windermere. We're here to ask permission to use the uh, freight shed dock on June 30th, Sunday, for a Canada Day church service. We would be there from 10.30 to about noon hour, and we bring chairs down from the church and set them up uh, so that people can sit under the freight shed during the service. Uh, our service does not interfere with any boat traffic or people going to their boats. In fact, the Windermere House and Windermere Marina supported us last year when we had that and it was a very hot day and the Windermere Marina actually had their pontoon boat right there and invited some of the elderly people to sit on that boat because they were a little late in getting a chair. So we are here to ask permission and you have in front of you a picture of what the freight shed looks like. 
questions? I think we're, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure do we actually even have to grant, it's a public place, you're not closing it off to the public. No. So I, I can tell you, from my own perspective, I support these kind of initiatives. I think they're great ideas to utilize our natural landscape and the, the uh, facilities of which we have, especially in and around the water. Thank you. So. Um, I'm just going to go to uh, Mr. Becking for comments. Curly Council's decision. Nodding of heads. Okay. Go. First of all, it is, is good for the uh, communities, these, these events. Uh, it was nice of you to ask uh, for uh, permission because uh, I know they usually do for fun day and everything else like that, and it's, it's normally granted. Um, and that, and I support it 100% in that. that. But like I say, it's just a case of with with them and that, that township should, when, when somebody's holding an event like that, the same as in a park, they rent or something like that, so asking, but uh, rather than just setting up and find somebody else is using it so thank you very much for uh, coming forward for this and I would support it thank you and um, we invite all of you to the service thank you we have an organist we have a choir we have a special guest singer thank you uh, Councilor Edwards um, the clerk has just suggested that we will bring forward a resolution tomorrow just to clarify uh, our intent uh, but I would definitely support that. Okay. thank you <laughs> all right thank you Um, Mr. Becking, do you need to do an introduction to this? No, Madam Chair. I'll comment afterwards. Good morning. How are you this morning? My name is Al Vanderhout. I live on 1391 Old Perry Sound Road. I'm here to speak to the Committee of the Whole with my concerns of the safety issue with the non-removal of winter sand on Old Perry Sound Road. I'm aware that the policies here are not to remove sand from rural paved roads yearly to only sweep before recovering. Well, Perry Sound Road is not your average rural paved back road. Let me explain. Well, Perry Sound Road is a 5.1 kilometer long road. It consists of only 1.7 kilometers of straight through nine sections, meaning nine separate little sections of the road are straight, being approximately 0.15 kilometers or less in length. This road consists of 19 corners, 19 hills, and nine extra hills and corners combined. The road has a very thick canopy of trees letting sporadic amounts of glaring sunshine through randomly. This road runs east to west, meaning that the sun is continuously on it. Now, that the concerns of, now with the concerns of the sand, with well, last winter being such a long and extreme winter, a very large amount of sand and sand salt mixture was used, being because of all the hills and corners, there's an excessive amount. The amount of sand left on the road is not going away. What it's doing is creating sand pockets and sand filled edges of the road, also causing covered roads to create new laneways, which means the edges of the road are covered in sand, the center of the road is covered in sand. For you to drive on a clear path of that paved road, these tires and these tires of opposite vehicles are traveling in different directions. Well, these tires are actually traveling towards each other. That's the only clear path you have. To pass a vehicle, you actually have to move into the sand-filled road to go by somebody. Also covering uh, is creating new road lanes on the road, creating new corners. The sand is being pushed off to the edge, creating a laneway to be moved over to the left or right, depending on the corner, meaning that the edges are covered with, with between one foot and three feet of sand. Uh, the, road, the road lanes have become three clear tire lanes like I was explaining it was sharing direction it was sharing the road in both directions leaving outside corners dangerous and slippery when it rains pockets of water are held on the road by the sand causing dangerous conditions not only are these driving safety hazards but also biking issues of safety and walking issues of safety now more about the unusual amount of traffic on this road Old Perry Sound is not your average cottage only paved back road we have businesses on this road. We have a library, we have a community center, we have a graveyard, we have a golf course, we have a restaurant, and we have one other business also on this road. The amount of traffic supplying these businesses are commercial traffic. 
from Cisco transport trucks to beer trucks to chip trucks to food suppliers to propane suppliers, FedEx trucks, maintenance vehicles, and also the town parks and recreation trucks traveling to the graveyard to service and cut the grass regularly. We have a school bus that turns around in the middle of an intersection at Ed Breeze Road and Old Perry Sound Road. Now this intersection is just completely coated in sand. This intersection consists of an uphill grade this way, a corner this way, and Ed Breeze coming down with a stop sign. Now this bus turns around right in that intersection. I've traveled that section and had cars slide through that intersection because of the sand. I hate to see it ever happens to the bus. Please also increase, we have increased traffic from the um, the timeshare area at the Diamond in the Rough. There's approximately 30 extra cars per weekend or the week that they're staying there traveling that road. We have extra vehicles on that road because of the golf course. We have extra vehicles on that road because of the community center. We have extra vehicles on that road because of the grave sites. We also have, uh, like I said, the community center is being used at all day, days, weeks, times of the day. Now the businesses in the graveyard are mostly being used by people not living on the road, not familiar with the conditions of the road. So as I've been told by some girl in the road department to drive accordingly to the conditions, I feel the conditions of the road should be made safe so I can drive on it. We have new road sweepers. Let's use them. The sand in the town is removed for safety reasons and let water flow. So let's do the same for the paved road that I live on. Not to mention a couple of incidents that I was involved in. Uh, like I said, um, there was a time that I was traveling along towards Ed Breeze Road when a car came down to the stop sign, couldn't stop, and she actually slid right out in front of me. If I had been a quarter of a second quicker, I would have been hit. There was a time that uh, by the graveyard where a car came down the hill to turn the corner, slid off the road into the ditch. I came along and actually had to jump into the ditch water to help the girl and her dog be removed from the vehicle. We've had uh, incidences of two years ago where the ambulances were called because two people on bicycles flipped, slid on the sand and wiped out and were injured. Um, Thank you. I just want to say that you are doing an excellent description of the area as I'm swaying and <laughs> and I think your point has been made very clearly. I'd like to actually go to sure. our public works department because um, I, I think that uh, we have this issue elsewhere but you've done an excellent description of, of what the challenges are in that area. Thank you. So if I can go to Ken Becking and... I'm sorry for my nervousness. It's just no. <laughs> this is the first thing, right? You know what? That's why I was giving you a break. Thank you. <laughs> I was shaking like crazy, so... Actually, yes, if we could have a copy of your presentation, that would be awesome. Of that? Yes. Sure, no problem. I've got one more page afterwards, but that's the plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, Madam Chair and Members of Council, um, I did go out and have uh, uh, a look at the situation. I drove the road uh, at the post speed, hammered the brakes. Um, certainly, I didn't have any difficulty in my personal vehicle controlling myself. Um, that said, my concern is for um, motorcycles, bicycles, etc., etc., which are not as stable, particularly on that kind of an environment. Um, I'm not unsympathetic to the deputant's view of the world. Um, if left to my own devices, it would already be swept, quite frankly. But there are uh, financial implications uh, and there's a policy decision that has to be uh, uh, addressed which is council's purview so uh, hence the reason why the matter is before you thank you uh, I'm gonna go to council now um, and get some direction from there and just uh. That is uh, a well-used road because uh, I've used it to go to the uh, community center. Uh, I see Lots people going to the golf course, uh, the, the uh, graveyard and that. And if we can clean it up, I, I would appreciate it for a simple fact that I do know somebody that was hit on a bicycle. This was a number of years ago and uh, sustained very serious injuries. So uh, I would support in that cleaning that road up at, at, at this point. Might we understand the costs associated with 
this uh, remediation? Um, Madam Chair, I, I um, would think that, you know, in this particular roadway, we're probably looking at a few hundred dollars. But this is one kilometer or five kilometers out of uh, 200 kilometers. So uh, it, it does represent a significant cost if council chooses to change the policy. It's not an insurmountable cost. It's, it's certainly uh, doable, but it does represent a significant cost. Thank you. That was my question. What else is out there in terms and costs? So thank you. That's for you, Chair. I, we certainly are. I personally have received many, many calls about our roads, and so the roads going from pavement back to its natural state. Here we have a situation where we actually have a paved road, and, and we've made it a gravel road. I mean, or a sand road. I mean, it is. It's an oxymoron. I mean. I, Sure, it's going to cost money. To, we should get that stuff off there. People are going to motorcycles. I saw the torrents just the other day, right at the lights. Guy comes on a motorcycle off Southwood Road. There's gravel on the road. Man, I don't know how we didn't die. So, you know, I, I think we need to comprehend what the cost of this would be, and then we need to make a business decision based on that. Madam Chair, just a quick uh, estimate. We're probably looking something in the order of twenty thousand dollars per annum per single application to all roads. To all roads. To all roads. I, I'm, I'm a little bit con, um, not understanding how to move this forward. So that we need to change uh, a policy and how do, like, I, 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 I don't want to go do, do this in September. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're currently in, in our sweeping operations currently. So uh, what it would mean is we would simply extend uh, the current operation to to undertake sweeping in, in uh, the other areas of the municipality where we do not traditionally sweep. Um, and that's simple direction of council. If council wishes to um, look at this in, in terms of a broader policy matter, uh, certainly staff can put forward a policy, a draft policy for your consideration at a later date. I, for one, would appreciate that. Um, I'll first go to Denelda and then I'll... Through you, I was just going to ask, could we not have an exemption for uh, health and safety issues for this road now and then look at the report later to see how much that would cost to take it into the, the other areas? I, 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 don't, I don't know that it necessarily follows under the health and safety issues because... Um, that would have to be weighed. There's, as, as was brought forward, some people can drive it, some can't. And so all I'm suggesting is that we actually, as a council, have to decide if we want to do a policy change and we have to send the message to. Um, I, again, it, it, we're, we're talking about 20,000 for the whole township, which we've got lots of roads in this sort of situation. Um, but again, Am I correct that there is a move afoot to stop the salt usage in the winter and go to sand? Is that not a, a concerted effort by... We, we weren't supposed to ever use salt. Right, so the point is we put, this, we put the sand on there to protect people in the winter months and then in the summer months, spring, summer, fall, we put them in jeopardy. So I just think that that's you know, the easiest $20,000 I've ever heard. Okay, so what's, on, what's in front of us right now is one road, Old Perry Sound Road. It's been identified as an issue. Um, Mr. Becking has said it's, it's relatively inexpensive to fix this issue for a safety issue. I'm in full support of doing that. I'm also full support of hearing what we could do for the whole township. But at this time, I just want to think, focus on what Mr. Vanderhoot is requesting. Uh, so, Council, we, we will bring um, a resolution forward tomorrow because it would need a, a, a direction that uh, staff can spend more money. And I would suggest um, that that resolution may not just include this particular property. Um, we would give leeway 
for other concerns that are going to come forward. I can tell you Southwood Road has always been an issue. Um, you know, there's all of those kind of things that um, need to be addressed, and so therefore it should be done by resolution, as I'm being advised by our clerk. We, if if it's a policy change, a policy would come back later. But if we're going to have authorization to spend twenty thousand dollars, we should approximately we should be in addition to our, our budget, we need to do that by resolution and get direction from council. So I guess the, the question is, are we just to, uh, dealing with this one specific road or is count, committee wanting to deal with the whole township? I think that's where we need to get clear direction. Um, thank you, and thanks, Alan, for uh, coming up. There's no need to be nervous. <laughs> We're normal people. This, that's uh, okay. We're normal people. The, um, uh, Ken, I guess a t question to you through the chair. Uh, number one, uh, will we sweep this road or will we use water to clear this road? Madam Chair, we, we have a sweeper, so we, okay. we sweep. Um, we, have, we do have a choice. We either pick up the sweepings or we don't pick up the sweepings. In this particular instance, we would not. Right. Normal practice would be to sweep it off to the side of the road. Okay. So, except for I guess almost a comment. Uh, you know, I, I've noted this winter my own personal road, I have more sand. I think it's a bigger issue this year Longer winter. based on the severity of winter and the application of sand particular. So I, I don't think we have to look at this going forward in perpetuity. Heaven forbid we actually get a couple days of significant downpour. The problem tends to clear itself as summer progresses. Previously, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't need don't think we need to change a policy to go in my own perspective into a we sweep every road by May 30th or whatever every year because depending on rains and what happens anything even the way the roads built whether or not drainage is increased or not is going to affect the amount of sand on there uh, I'm, I'm happy to say let's try and put a sweeper out and get this done going forward I, I don't think we need to do it if someone was to come in and say can you sweep my road too that's great we're now live and People can make that request if it's bad, but by the time they get here, maybe that road will be solved. Again, I do believe, though, we would have to bring forward a resolution to spend more money. It's depending on are you talk, we you have to decide are we doing one road or are we doing all the roads because everybody's saying there's other roads that need to be addressed. So we, the staff, need clear direction on what we're to do. Sorry, thank you, and uh, through you. Um, I would like to echo the comments from Councillor Roberts that today we have somebody who's come forward with an issue, and is there a way that we can help in this particular case? And, and uh, wondering, is there an opportunity for us to understand the, this in a more robust manner as we move to our general committee? Um, is this something that could come back as a conversation point? Because what Councillor Zavitz just mentioned is we do clear these roads in the winter. You know, is this, I don't know if this is a, a bigger issue or not, other than what I'm currently hearing us talk about around the table today. I'm just going to go here. Thank first. you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I think, uh, you know, there's been a number of really relevant points around the table, and I think to all of your points, we have the immediate issue of this particular section of road which can be addressed through uh, nominally, uh, probably absorbed into the annual budget. Then we have the broader issue of, you know, uh, what do we sweep now? What is our practice? What is the policy? And I'm not sure that you're aware of that and perhaps a report should come back from, for information purposes. And if you wish to, to change that, uh, I'm also aware of, you know, the mayor's comment with respect to, you know, that was an unusual winter. Is that something we're going to see more of going forward? 
potentially and so that may give us the opportunity to, to determine if we want to adjust the policy but I think probably an info report coming back saying what is the policy now what do we sweep is probably a good starting point thank you madam chair um, I agree wait the policy may not need to be changed based on mayor Harding's comments but we've had an unusual winter and I have to tell you as a cyclist on my road it is dangerous getting out to the main road is not easy and I think we could be proactive for all of our constituents by saying just this one year let's do it all for twenty thousand dollars and let's vote on it tomorrow so that's my thought on it uh, you know we just heard uh, something from Fred Chan's about reuse and recycle if we're sweeping this up can it be picked up and recycled at some some point uh, it's just a thought. I, I don't think it's worth it, but it is a thought because it's sand and no, it's con it's considered a contaminated waste. So it has to if it's if it's to be reused, then it has to be taken to a sanitary landfill site. Okay. I like the uh, hey, CAO. I, hang on, just hurry. Sorry. Just, go ahead. Sorry, uh, through you, uh, I'd like to take care of this problem. Uh, it's here, it's now. We've heard a great story. Um, but I'd also like to know enough about the policy to make a decision at some other point about whether we need to amend a policy to uh, one time or per, you know, in perpetuity treat the roads differently. I'd like a cup of tea, but I'm afraid we'd all decide to, you know, boil the ocean or something. I mean, we, we really don't need, I don't, I think we've got a problem that just needs to get fixed. By the sound of it, there's, there's at-risk users, it's precarious, uh, and we'll get it cleaned up. But if it's part of a bigger issue, we just need to look at it and decide it separately. I agree with the CAO's uh, recommendation that we fix this issue and then bring a report back to deal with the broader issue. Yeah, it's the same thing. And again, this problem ultimately, with rains today, with rains next week, the, the problem rectifies itself annually with, with, with less sand. With less sand. Yeah. Well, it, it, it removes it. You happen to have one that someone's complaining. I appreciate my, again, my own road. I have to drive a little bit more cautious within two weeks from now. And I know from two weeks from yesterday, it's already that much better and it will be getting better and back to normal. Um, I, I am concerned. I, I could not support a $20,000. Let's go fix everybody's road without people complaining. You know, we're spending taxpayer money here at the end of the day. And yes, we're increasing, but we're increasing the level of service that we haven't done before. We have an identifiable road. We have an identifiable issue in this particular case that's exceptionally bad. And I, I get it, but I, I don't need to make it a blanket problem to the whole township. So let's fix one road and then let's look at a policy going forward uh, as to where we want to go. That's my perspective. Do you have your direction? I know what I'm doing. <laughs> You want to share that? Um, I think what I'm hearing, Madam Chair, is that uh, we're going to address this particular situation. Um, and I'll come back with uh, perhaps a, a, a document that will give you some insights into what is the nature of the situation and perhaps uh, some, uh, some options for uh, uh, making this a, a less debatable issue in the future. Thank you. So we'll be moving on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, you're all here. Give it to you right now. So um, I'll, I'll just bring Gord Smith forward. Thank you very much for those that have uh, um, been sitting through the last hour and a half of delegations that were, um, I hope that everyone's 
had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about our township. Um, but Mr. Smith is going to be talking about the Moon River. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a note that public speaking is the second most stressful thing that anyone can do. One, one last thing. There has, there, and, and committee, there. This listening's the third. <laughs> committee, there, there also was a request to, to give a little bit more time rather than having uh, both him and his spouse speak. Um, uh, and I hope that you indulge him because this is an important discussion. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, Your Worship, Mayor Philip Harding, uh, members of council, department heads, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope I didn't miss anybody. Uh, my name is Gordon Ross Smith, and I prefer the name Ross, because my father's name is Gordon, and I was always called by my second name. I'm a retired firefighter from the city of Mississauga, retired with the rank of captain after 34 years of service. My wife, Sharon Eccles, is in the crowd. Uh, she's also retired as the former assistant vice president of uh, Hanover Reinsurance Company of Canada. We are residents of Bala. Uh, we live on the Lionel Avenue on the Moon River, Whitefish Bay. We've been long-term seasonal residents. Uh, are now retired on our home uh, on Lionel Avenue, and it's our primary residence. My own family history, my great-grandfather built cottages and uh, lived on Gull Lake and Gravenhurst. We now have six generations of, of history in Muskoka. My reason for being here today is due to the recent flooding on the Moon River and how the now frequency of these high water events. I'm not going to go through my whole brief, which I think you've all been provided with. I'll just highlight things. Uh, after the flood of the century in 2013, my wife and I decided that we were going to be proactive and uh, change our property uh, to inhibit the water from flooding us out. Uh, we had a very nice stone wall built by uh, Bedrock Landscaping. Our neighbor, Jeff Overbeek, did a great job. And that was a foot higher than the flood of the century. Well, we all know what happened this year. I think it was two and a half feet over that. I could stand in my driveway and hip waders, and the water was to my chest. Uh, we basically, we lived on an island for over 24 days, and it's not romantic. And we all know, as residents of the Moon River, what the problem is. Uh, all the water that comes through the watershed, and uh, Mayor Philip Harding was at the uh, Mr. Poa on Saturday and alluded to the facts of how much water comes through the watershed and ultimately over the falls and into the Moon River. The Moon River chute cannot take the water. It backs up. It's like a six-lane highway that we've all been used to getting into two lanes. Uh, it's a restriction. What we, my wife and I, are proposing in the way of a viable solution will be reasonable, practical, morally and ethically sound, and legally defensible. We propose that the Township of Muskoka Lakes become proactive, step up, to relieve the problem of the restrictions to water flow at the Moon River Chutes during the time of high water events. We propose the Township set up a committee to do a feasibility study, research, formulate a plan, to relieve the restrictions to water flow at the Moon River Chutes during high water events and direct the overflow through an emergency spillway or channel from the Moon Chutes Bay. There is a map at the back of the presentation and I've kind of highlighted some reasonable things that can be looked at. So it diverts the water from the Moon River past the Moon River Dam and the, and the Moon River Chutes. We further propose that this said committee be made up of a township councillor Township engineer, township legal, emergency service personnel, public works, works excuse me, uh, Mr. Poa representatives, and a private citizen who's a stakeholder on the moon. I'd be willing to put my name forward to sit on that committee, as would probably Drew Cowan, who had 5,000 sandbags around his house. He was the president of Mr. Poa. This committee would research and draft a plan that would be presented to council at a date to be determined with the intent, if accepted by Council, would petition the Ontario government to implement the said plan of a, a diversion plan or emergency water flow from the Moon River Chutes during high water events. We further propose that the current Muskoka watershed plan is not adequate for present weather condition, being that if it's climate change or whatever, and should be revisited as well as amended to include a flood or high water control. I would propose that this council petition the appropriate government ministries and start a process to amend the current water management plan. 
We believe that these proposals are reasonable and practical due to the current and ongoing high water events that are occurring on a more frequent basis. And as I noted to Councillor Bridgman, that I've been here all my life. And I don't believe that uh, this is just nature. I think it's a problem with mismanagement. Uh, we've technically been flooded out three times in six years. And I'm tired. It's practical as the situation of high water events appear to be man-made through current water management plan being inadequate, and modern engineering methods can rectify or moderate the threat to life, property, and businesses created by these high water events. It's morally sound and ethical thing to do for the citizens in the affected areas whose lives, property, and businesses are now being threatened on an almost annual basis by these high water events. It would be legally defensible as the correct thing to do, as it would protect this township from possible future lawsuits if this council is not proactive and step up to take corrective action to solve this problem. On a personal note, this has become very upsetting and frustrating for my, me and my wife. It seems that every spring we face the events that are getting harder and harder to face. To see your life's dreams and home threatened is not what we wanted for our retirement. We are tired and we don't want to do it again. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Ross. Any questions? I called you, Gord, too. Yeah. And I've known you forever. I've been, so. call, I've been called worse. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, for your presentation. I agree wholeheartedly with your suggestion. Um, this uh, During the flood this year, I actually ventured out to the chutes. Uh, you can access it uh, off Min River Road through Camp Jackson Road. Mm -hmm. And I actually went to Camp Jackson and witnessed it personally. And you can see firsthand the problem that exists there. And I think his suggestion of a committee uh, to look into this, uh, aside from the, the broader view of the watershed management program, which should be looked at too, but that'll take years, I think we should pursue that. And I would certainly volunteer to be a council rep on that committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, certainly, I was, I have been involved with with the Smiths and others in in that area long before the there was a recognition of flooding happening because there were people that were being impacted early, and and something we certainly learned in 2013. I really hope that this municipality can move forward with a plan in, in, in many ways of, of that we will learn from, um, from the past and have future direction of how to deal with certain situations. Um, but certainly uh, setting up a committee I think would be um, the first step and seeing how that progresses uh, and those discussions and involving the public that has been so uh, badly affected. I stopped going to visit the Smiths because I couldn't get there. And I wasn't going to call for you to bring a boat. <laughs> so there you go. Well, thanks to Jeff Overbeek, we had a little bit of a bigger boat uh, to bring in sandbags. We had to bring sandbags in by boat. Uh, my little tinny could take about nine uh, with my bulk in the boat. Uh, Jeff's could take about 20, so we brought in over 400. Uh, on a personal note, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Ruth Nishikawa. Back in the flood of 2013, I believe she was at a conference in Calgary, and I talked to her on the phone, and she made herself available uh, to help one of our neighbors, Ruth Hancock, who was in a serious situation. And this time again, uh, Ruth stepped up, and I thank you for your um, thanks, and thanks, Ross, for the uh, comments. Um, just a bit of background for yourself, if you're not aware. This council in 2013 and the District of Muskoka in 2013 both made recommendations into the province to look at the entire Muskoka River water management plan, to look at our watershed, to identify choke points within that. Obviously, Moon River Chutes is a choke point. Uh, in 2016, Township Muskoka Lakes, District of Muskoka, again made recommendation and re request to the province to look at the choke points to understand the watershed. In 2019, this past January, 
myself, Councilor Jaglowitz, along with uh, Mayor Graydon Smith, uh, Councilor Maloney from Bracebridge, all met with the MNRF. Their comment was, if you need to change the plan, put a recommendation forward. We did in 2019 this winter. Lake of Bays also requested a thing to the province. All that went missing. Nothing has been done. It sat flat. What did happen through this flood is we had the opportunity when the Premier was here to catch his ear, and he has committed to look at and study the watershed. Um, I'm somewhat concerned and appreciate as soon as you were speaking, I'm not sure what other councillors had, I've had a number of, of local residents also say, you can't just blow up the Moon River chutes, we're going to be below and we're going to flood below. So when I look at above the chutes and I look at below the chutes, we're one portion of 200 kilometers of watershed and we need to understand what goes on in Bala Bay because the dams in Bala can spill roughly 400 cubic meters per second, but I can only put roughly 300 into Bala Bay. So we need to look at Bala Park Island at the same time. As we move up the watershed, we need to understand at times how to hold water back and how to move water through the system faster. Is the infrastructure appropriate? So yes, we're down here. But there's another 180 kilometers worth of watershed that we need to understand. Below the chutes, naturally, two-thirds of the water goes out the Moon River. What can the dam on the Moon River hold and accommodate? Maybe that needs to be increased in water flow as well, because if I'm now going to spill, let's say, 400 cubic meters around the chutes, where is that water going? So there's a bigger picture than beyond Township of Muskoka Lakes. And I appreciate that we need to look at this. This needs hydrologists, this needs environmentalists, this needs Mishoka Watershed involved. Um, there are, I see uh, Patricia Arney's with us here. Um, thank you. And uh, there are many individuals way smarter than anyone combined around this table about how we can move water more effectively and at times hold water back because climate change not only gives us a month's worth of rain in three days, it also gives us 28 days of drought. When we start holding water back in the system and it has to, logs have to go in and stop, it's not healthy for the environment. We need the water to be flushing through to maintain that. So both extremes need to be understood and mapped and understood. And I, and I will say, Chair John Clink was the one that mentioned probably a year ago that we may need to create a Lake Mead so to speak, further up the watershed. And I can go into great detail about what happened this year. And, and I will say, and I'll use the words mismanagement, I, I don't disagree with that, that uh, the province could have done a better job. And the Premier agreed that they could have done a better job. So as a bit of background, because we haven't had an opportunity, so you know, two weeks ago, um, a number of stakeholders who were involved in declaration of emergency, the mayors were there, uh, Chair John Clink was there, Muskoka Watershed was there, uh, Vic Fidelli, our um, Minister of Finance was there, and then we had parliamentary assistance from uh, Ministry of Housing as well as um, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources. And it was not a, you need to fix this, we were really looking forward saying, okay, here's the issues we face today. Here's some financial infrastructure problems, you know, disaster relief allows us to rebuild a road but not to a higher standard. Uh, Chair Clink and I were also in a meeting on Monday with uh, Minister uh, Clark, again, talking about those same things, that we need at times better money, more money, to increase our infrastructure to be able to manage the water level. But what the province did in this initial meeting was they kept it internal, and I understand that, because, as I said, as soon as you say we want to divert water, I have a number of people saying, you can't divert water, you're going to flood me out below the chutes. And everybody complains as soon as you make any changes. So what I firmly believe, and I'll also look to council because I am one of ten around this table though, is that we need to do a better job of both moving water through the system and at times restricting water flows so that we always have water available to move through the system. It's not just affecting the chutes. There's more to it than that. And so what I am personally 
going to hold the province accountable to and have had some success already over the last sort of 60 days or even 30 days is getting the province's attention that this plan is broken. We need to address this plan and we again need to address the physical limitations. You are but one of the physical limitations within the watershed. So before we go marching down a road saying what we need to do, I want to try and get the bigger picture, see where the province is going to go, see what money they're going to put involved to understand the hydrology of all this and then where we need to go. Will Township Muskoka Lakes, will Mr. Poa, will all the appropriate people be stakeholders at this? 100%. And I think that's the other big difference that the Premier has said um, in a press conference back a month ago now that the municipalities will have a seat at the table to be able to discuss this water management plan. So I, it doesn't strike a committee because again, we can all go spin our wheels, and I don't mean negatively, but going down a road saying this is the only thing we have to do, but we have to look at it in its totality. Um, watershed has to be there, and um, I, I'm going to suggest that over the next 30, 60, 90 days we're going to start to make some changes. And what the province did say and what the Premier did say is there will probably be some short-term mitigation measures to protect property owners, and then there will also be some long-term that may take five years, ten years to implement, you know, if we're going to build a 20 kilometer spillway to move water from the north branch of the river potentially to the south branch north of Huntsville, that those are contemplations that take multiple years to figure out how those happen. So um, it, it's a big job. It's not just a matter of just moving water around. 100% identified from 2013, 2016, 2019 yourself today, Moon River Shoots is a problem. But there's bigger problem. Thank you. I, I understand that. I just my my point is that I think time for inaction is over. The old Bob, Joe, and Fred method seemed to work for 60 years, where they just had some guys on the side of the river look up and phone his buddy and pull two logs out, put two logs in. That worked. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, I, my I, thoughts are, I'm tired, uh, and quite frankly, I don't want to. I don't want to be the last generation in Muskoka. I think frankly. also, I, I, if, I, if I could, um, Ross, you and I had discussed lots of different um, scenarios and things uh, that, that would improve how you were affected and, and also our timelines and things. And that's more along the line of, I don't think there was any expectation that we'd, we'd be trying to change the water shed management plan at this point um, but it's it's what we can do within our own township and that will help those affected in our own township along with these requests and I, I believe um, the importance of including the general public in these discussions so whether we get to a committee or however that looks I do I don't feel that I personally would like to go through another year or two of another flood without having those discussions. Um, so I'm just going to move on to Glenn and then I really would like to move forward to the next speaker who's also discussing this yes. similar stuff. Thank you. So, thank you. Through you, Chair. So, thank you very much for your presentation. I think anyone sitting around this council table having gone through what we just have uh, can be nothing but, con uh, there's two words, uh, concern and, and, and I draw a certain comfort. If I, if I could, from the, the words of our mayor. Uh, you know, I, I can't go beyond the township in my own mind. I don't want to talk about Doug Ford and, I, and the, the district. My point is, when the mayor said weeks ago, enough is enough, I, I, you know what, that's good enough for me. Um, I hope I can say that uh, in the overall scheme of things. I am going to hold you personally responsible. Uh, and, and you stood up and you stood up and accepted that, and I understand that. That was a social, public statement you made. Uh, I am very concerned, and I think everyone has to be, all thousands and thousands of us who own property, who enjoy Muskoka, who love Muskoka, we have to stand up and be responsible. Mm -hmm. the, the day is over yes. for just Thank standing you. around yes. talking about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry.
I just have a technical question because what you were proposing with the spillways, we couldn't do that anyway, could we? I mean, the the the, the whole program is in is yeah, in yes. our hands. It, that, so that I, is I just, a, that, technically, I just wonder. Yeah, to... for this specific ask about the shoots. Yeah. Um, you're right. It's a much bigger picture. Uh, although, again, what it has I had mentioned, there were some discussions not that that I had had not just with Ross but others affected, and again. Uh, my first email was March 26th, a concern about, wow, I've never seen our mill stream dry. What's going on, right? And so it's just those little warning signs that um, how, you know, it seems that uh, if you're part of a, a group of the Friends of Muskoka, for instance, they get a voice because they're a large active group. And should there be more? Should there be some kind of something that uh, the people that are really truly affected by the flooding that is is unusual, you know, for the number of years they've been on their property? So that's where I see as a, as a something that we can do as as a, a township. And I'll just leave it at that. I think that um, we'll hear from Mr. Ford and then go forward from there. I was just asking that a committee be struck to see if it's feasible not to build it and then ask the appropriate government agencies to step up. That was the idea behind my com committee to see if it's feasible. Thank you for your time. I think it's good afternoon, actually. Or darn close to it. Anyways, um, I'm Martin Ford. I think most of you probably know who I am. Uh, I live at 1040 Curry Street in Bala. We're small business people, uh, fourth generation cottager. I've lived here for a really long time permanently, so I've seen a lot. I live on Lake Muskoka, and uh, we're in the part of the lake where you actually can see the water in the dead of winter at minus 40 because it never freezes. Um, I must say, I, as I was listening to this, and oh, please excuse any spelling errors because it was done late at night. Um, I was I was listening, and I thought to myself, "There's a lot of information that I don't think people know," and in some ways, I almost feel like throwing out this thing because I go, "There's stuff that should be addressed." But I'll quickly go through um, what I get. So the ask, I'm, I'm really glad to hear uh, that the mayor is affirming that uh, there is positive action from the provincial government, from the premier to actually look at it. I think specifically from what we have, and sort of to fill in something that I hadn't planned to fill in until I got farther into this, was that I was approached uh, by the president of a very large engineering firm out of Toronto. Uh, and he goes, like, this is crazy. Like, what do you know? So we started to talk. <clears throat> and this large engineering firm has engineers and has people that do, have stuff to do with the weather and all that kind of stuff, to be kind of very broad. So anyways, we started to talk about it, and we said, okay, what, what, what is really going on? Is it the weather? Is it the hydro plants? What, what has truly changed? <clears throat> and so, yes, getting the premier to actually have a, an independent group of pro professionals uh, to research it <clears throat> that's not connected to has no special interests. I mean, maybe they're out of the United States, for all I care. <clears throat> I don't care where they come from. All I care about is that they actually are truly independent, unbiased. And I think that's probably the biggest thing. And uh, I sort of poked at the Premier as well, the same thing. Uh, we do know each other. We're not related, but we do know each other. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, I think that's really important. I think it's really important that we keep poking because if we don't keep poking, you know, you can already see it. You know, people are getting happy, the water's getting warm, you know, it's kind of floods over, and that's exactly what happened in 2013. Everybody's figured out oh, it's not going to happen again, which it did. So I think it's very important. And that was what the first ask was, is that we continue to go after them. I think it's very important that they independently look at it, because from what we see, the plan actually isn't broken. Uh, it appears that it's broken, but there are, and I don't want to get technical, I, I've learned a lot, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I've learned a huge amount of information. 
And there are ranges. There are normals, and then there's exceptions to normals. There's averages, and they tend to run on averages, which tends to flatline a lot of stuff. And so when you have a rain event, which is not a abnormal, as my wife said to me, she goes, apparently somebody forgot the old saying, April showers bring May flowers, right? And it rains. That's what happens, right? So uh, you maybe should need to figure that one out. So uh, looking at it, these engineers looking at it, climatologists looking at it, uh, specifically this year, uh, it, it was very cold this spring. You've had all this snow, you've got all this water stored in it, but in actual fact, it was too cold for it to really get released. Uh, we didn't have a lot of rain, and I'm like jumping way out of the topic here. Uh, we didn't have a lot of rain. Compared to the 2013 flood, it was about 330 millimeters of rain. This one was like 130 millimeters of rain. So you got frozen water. You don't have as much rain. Lake Rosso and Lake Joe didn't get flooded, so it's not environmental. Lake Muskoka had 160% more water in it than 2013. How did this happen? So, anyways, like I've skipped over, but I'm going to come back to it. Um, I think what's really important is to assess, if, get some facts. One of the set of facts that we really need a lot of is how much has it cost the township of Muskoka Lakes? How much has it cost the district of Muskoka? How much did it cost all the other regions? Because this is all going to come down to money. I can guarantee you this. So, what we have to do, in my humble opinion, is we have to have a plan. We have to say, okay, this is how much this flooding is costing us. The plan to deal with flooding every year is probably not a really good plan because you have 40 years of not having flooding. So, page two. <laughs> um, and that's what, kind of what our point is. And as I said, I don't want to get technical because you could be at this for hours. But from 1940 to 2012, 29 megawatts of power has been consistently produced out of the Muskoka watershed. Now, a lot of us have been on the watershed. We've seen high water, but we certainly haven't seen the flooding that we have seen. So it raises a question, why, right? So the engineers were looking at it and they go, well, why, why, why? Like these guys love numbers, right? They, they won't take anything at face value. I'd throw something at, well, that sounds interesting, Martin but let's check it out, right? So anyways, uh, they looked at it and they go, you know what, the plan really hasn't changed at all of any substance this entire time. There's been tweaks here and there. Uh, there's been tweaks for fish habitat, um, but there has been no significant changes until 2012. And in 2012, what the significant change was, was the increase of production hydroelectricity. I think we have to flip a page. So on page three, the most significant thing, and this is what you've got to really look at, there are three hydro plants in 2012 that had been finished being upgraded, and it's a 305% increase in their capacity to produce power. Well, in order to produce power, you need water, right? So let me drink some water. What they discovered was is that they obviously had to pool water. So if you do have an event, and events are normal, and they change, but they, they're normal, how do you get rid of the water? Because you're storing water. Because these plants that have dramatically been increased require water. All that water is north of Bryce Bridge. So they're pooling water. And that's what they figured out. It took them a long time to figure out where they were pooling the water because, you know, you got to look at all the different gauges. They were dealing with the federal government's data, and they go, we know when, we know where they were pooling the water. They also know, as I said, that the water in the snowpack was staying there because it was too cold. It never got warm enough at night. It never got warm, sorry, never got warm enough in the day, and it was cold at night. So it just stayed there. So it wasn't that the water was getting released out of the snowpack. Uh, we know that the rainfall was substantially lower than in 2013. So what's the problem? Keeps going back to the same place. 
They're pooling water for the production of hydroelectricity. And so for 40 years, 29 megawatts, we then jumped to 35 megawatts, a 20% increase over the whole system, but 305% in those plants just above Bracebridge. So uh, these, and in fact, you can even see the numbers. We went from 2 megawatts to 8.1 megawatts of production. So it's all about storing. Um, and then I already mentioned what happened to Lake Muskoka. So, and this is what they said. They go, well, hold on a second. If, if it's environmental, why didn't Lake Rosso and Lake Joe flood Lake, Lake Muskoka? Because certainly in 2013, it was pretty evenly distributed, the amount of flooding. So you have 160% more water in Lake Muskoka this year. Where did it come from? It wasn't the snowpack. It wasn't the rain like 2013. Where did it come from? Keys pointing to the same place. Stored water for the production of hydroelectricity. So, skipping to the next one, um, what we're thinking that would be most valuable, because we believe that if we can make an argument that this doesn't make economic sense, then we can probably prevent, convince the provincial government to solve the problem. So they need to be motivated. And they're not going to be motivated by paying the rich people money to fix their properties because they can't afford health programs, right? So, because I can just hear it now. You know, you can't, you can't pay for this health program. You're cutting on drug addiction programs and you're going to pay a bunch of rich guys for their, to fix their cottages? I don't think so. You know, well, there's a lot of us in here to different degrees fall into that category. Um, you know, I recognize it. it's just not going to happen. So I think it's really important that TML looks and does a report and say, this is the economic impact to ourselves. Now, if you can get the other jurisdictions to do it as well, that would be most helpful. If the district can do the same thing, I think that would be most useful. And because we can say, look at, you know, planning for more flooding is going to cost us more money. And certainly the provincial government and Mr. Ford is all about the taxpayers and the money. Right? It's like the, the, the conversation that you guys had 45 minutes ago about $20,000 to clean the sand. Like, where do you stop? You've got to stop. There's eventually you run out of other people's money, as Margaret Thatcher says. So, summary. Now, I've, I've done a lot. I said really a lot. I've already told you that it was the three hydro plants that are probably the cause. Climatological data that they looked at using experts in the field, they're saying it's not the climate. It's, it's just not it. You can't prove it. There's no information there to prove that it is. So that's the summary page. We have a couple of concerns. Um, so you, you, 40 years, 29 megawatts, no problem. Plan has remained more or less the same. With the increase of production at those three hydro plants, taking up to 35 megawatts, and amazingly in 2013, we have a problem when these plants come online. So you say to yourself, okay, well, we can't, we can't cope with it now. You know, we get rain events, which are normal. We can't handle it. And, uh, you know, building ways to get the water out of here sounds like a great plan, but it appears that we don't even need to do that. We just need to solve the problem. And the problem is pooling of water. So, so that's our concern. So that, well, that's one of our concerns. So putting the Bala Falls plant, I know everybody hates talking about the Bala Falls plant, but uh, call it 4.2 megawatts or saying higher than that, they're going to want to pool water. Where are they going to pool it? Oh, Lake Ross and Lake Joe would be a great place to pool it, wouldn't it? So you have some event we're right back in the same problem again. Because there's no effective method without costing the province of Ontario and the municipalities and the district a ton of money to solve this problem. The problem keeps going back to the same place. It's the hydro plants. And it begs a serious question. We have another question that really concerns us, and it hasn't happened yet, but we know it's about to happen. 
And I can appreciate if I was the hydro plant, I'd want to do the same thing. And that is that they want a diversion wall. So you've got the North Falls. And you've got where all the water goes over the North Falls, right? Well, they want to cut basically half of it off and drive that water towards the plant. Makes perfectly a sense if you're in production of electricity and making money, right? Terrible plan for the rest of us, though. Because if you can't get the water over the falls now, enough of it out, blocking half of it is a terrible plan, right? So we're really concerned. Now, you can always tear that out. It'll probably get in there before we can stop it, from what we can tell. But uh, all it's going to do is make the whole problem worse. And it's going to go all the way up to the top. Martin, I have to just move you forward. if it I'm going as fast as I can. I'm on my last page, I promise. So anyways, the argument really then is why, and I won't read it, it's there, you can talk about it. The question is, is why are we catering to the hydro plants? So you've got roughly, I don't know what it is, nine to $11 billion worth of assets in TML alone. I understand it's about $23 billion worth of assets across all the lakes. And we're, we don't know the exact numbers, but we're estimating that if you take up the investment in the plants that are in the system today, maybe 300 million. So you say to yourself, okay, what's the benefit here? Well, certainly not taxes, because anybody that invests 300 million is not going to be paying the same amount of taxes as 23 billion or 11 billion or whatever number you want to pick. Employment? How many people are they employing on the long term? Hardly nothing. You know, you take all the construction that goes on. I mean, 26% of the people in the township of Muskoka, like I'm going as fast as I can, uh, are, are employed in the construction industry. Everything we have, these beautiful facilities, our, our skating rinks, our parks, our, you know, our docks, who are they paid by? They're paid by the lakefront owners, not the hydro plants. So why are we catering to this group of people? They're, they're, they're sucking it out of the rest of us, and we're all having to pay. So I think that's really the big message to the Ford government. You go, you're for the people. You're about not wasting money. So, you know, you talk about the costs to all of us to mitigate our exposure to flooding. Why should we have to do this? You know, we've invested way more than they have. So, in our humble opinion, he needs to deal with the hydro companies. How he's going to deal with it, that's entirely up to him. But, there you go. Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. Questions? Yes. Sure. <laughs> so, Martin, I appreciate pooling has caused issues, and you talk about the increase in hydro plants. I have a bit of a disconnect. I, I don't disagree with a lot that you're saying, but no, I have a no, disconnect I, in yeah. one thing because the three hydro plants that have increased production to 305% are all north of Lake Muskoka. Yes. So if I pool water north of Lake Muskoka, I'm going to flood north of Lake Muskoka. Well, actually, but there's, yet, a, there's like, an answer to that question. Muskoka, well, Moon River was the hardest hit. Mm -hmm. We know that. Lake Muskoka was significantly hit, and Rosso and Joe, incidentally, were also hit. No, so, so they're up two feet, Muskoka up four, Moon River up seven. But all that is below where, quote unquote, water is pooled to generate hydro, in your perspective. So help me. Sure. So one of the things that they discovered, because they couldn't figure it out, because they had the same question, because that's what I said. And they so they, they took some time, they did their research, and they go, Oh, Lake of Bays. So Lake of Bays was run down, from what I recall. It was dropped. And then Lake of Bays was starting to be pooled for water. It wasn't the only one, but it was the most significant one. It took them a while to figure it out. So indeed, actually, they were pooling. Now, unfortunately, there is no statistical data of pooling because there's no equipment north, like up in Algonquin Park. So they said, you know, we're blind. We, we, we don't know that. Um, they have been trying to get more information uh, confirmed from MNR, and they're being stonewalled on uh, the water uh, content in the snow up in Nelconquin Park.
But the climatological information is showing that it wasn't melting. But what they do know is water was being pooled uh, up there. It was also compounded, and not in this document, but if you read the, uh, sur the petition, so I don't know if I said this at the beginning. So we have over 6,000 people that have signed the petitions. And in petition number three, um, there is very specific information, not in huge detail, about what the cause timeline was. And so one of the issues was is that they choked off uh, the flow, and it started, I think, on the 26th of March at 1130, as I recall, um, in both north of Bracebridge and south. Uh, like, sorry, do you want me to stop? So anyway, so, so they know, right? They've, they've, and they've been very systematic. I mean, these guys are civil engineers. Me? Yeah, well, that's not me. That's not what I do for a living. So they were very particular. They looked at it. They wanted to be able to stand behind the numbers. They believe they can stand behind the numbers. These guys' customers are, oddly enough, some of the hydro plants. They know the Muskoka watershed very well. They know the Ottawa one, too. They said the Ottawa problem is very similar. Uh, and, of course, that's going all the way down to Montreal with different churches. We all go, we're not getting into that problem. But it appears to be very similar. So that's what it's all pointing to. So that's going back to the Doug Ford thing with the government. You know, if we can encourage them, like we don't want it to come out of us because everybody's going to go, well, who are you? Um, although the engineers could certainly stand up, but they have a little bit of a problem because that's how they make their money. Um, say to them, look, you know what? There's enough evidence here. We can sit down, have our 15-minute conversation, and uh, this is what you need to do. You need to get independent people that are highly qualified that are not in any way engaged in the hydro plants and, and the watershed and do a natural study. But you have 40 years of no issue. High water, yes, but not flooding. 29 megawatts, no big deal. Okay, so, thank you. I'm just going to go to Councillor Zavix then. Through you, Chair. To Mr. Ford. So given the 2013 flood, which you contemplated, and obvious, your obvious research and, and dedication to this particular topic, could you share your observations on what would have happened had the uh, watershed plan been recalibrated in 2016 uh, what what would that look like in this spring you know what from what we all understand they, they don't have to do anything it's all there that plan actually is more than capable of dealing it what it is is that and this is where it starts to get a little more technical and I, I remember a lot just to be hugely dangerous but uh, what they do is they, they have different marks on it and you can see it but they, they tend to flatline. They go for averages as opposed to whatever. But what's really interesting is that they're going, well, in the plan, it actually allows them to look at weather events and go, you know what? We need to actually lower it below the average. But they didn't do it. That was a choice not to do it. And so really that's what the answer is. It's not the plan. Weirdly, it's not the plan from what we can tell is that they don't implement their own plan. They're not taking advantage. And you can understand it. Go back to the hydro plants. How do you make your money? You make your money by the water. You pool water. You're going to, and a lot of business people run risks, right? That's why they do as well as they do relative to everybody else. So they go, you know what? We store a little bit higher. In fact, in, fact, in December, uh, 2018, Lake, I don't know about Rosso and Joe, but 2018, Lake Muskoka was extraordinarily high. And, uh, and one of the complaints that was coming out of it was is that in December, we were actually relatively cold and relatively quiet, and so the lake froze. And they started to draw it down. They were ripping off people's fascia boards off their docks. So there, there's so much information there that he's pointing back it's all about cooling water. So, I don't know. That's why I said, I, I, you know, for us, it's two asks. And I, I didn't mean to go into this kind of detail. 
go after the Ford government and say, you need an independent, because that, they're going to believe their own study and make sure that they're truly independent. We would love to be able to put, be part of it in the sense of just making sure that they're on the path, right? They don't get lost. And uh, the second one is if we can get financial information out of TML and the other jurisdictions and be able to make a financial case where you go, their investment is three, 300 million approximately. The rest of us have put a fortune into it. Solve the problem. Problem's not us, the problem is them. So that information would be most useful. Thank you. One last one. And through the chair, um, am I wrong in thinking that the it, there was it was uh, contemplated that the that the the wall at the Bala Hydro plant was going to be removable? No, sorry, it's a concrete wall, from what I understand. And no, no, sorry, I I know it now is, but right. was it not contemplated back in the day that um, that that would be something that they would put in the diverter wall, but that it would be able to come out given a particular high water event. For example, if that was there this year, that would have been cataclysmic. That would have probably blown over anyway. Yeah, I, I don't know. So, I, I so there, there have, in, in my experience over the years, there were many different plans. Um, and I, I don't think that we should try to nail down what plan was in place and, and all of that sort of thing. And certainly we're not going to hold you uh, to answer that. I know nothing. I just want to comment uh, at this point. Um, very glad that Chair Clink is in the audience. I'm not going to ask you to come and speak, but I know that you will move things forward in the best way you possibly can at the district level. Uh, and, and we've heard your requests. Okay. I think... Um, what we do as, as the township, we'll go back to more uh, discussions through committees and, um, and, and we'll, we'll not be forgotten. I'll, sure. I'll just say that. Um, and I think mostly, again. So just a quick comment to your perspective, Martin. Uh, we actually have some figures as well already. Sure. In, in round numbers, Township Muskoka Lakes is our own infrastructure is about three and a half million in damage. Really? Um, oh, okay. But the one thing I know uh, Ms. Arnie and Ch Chair Clink will also agree, uh, three weeks ago I, I pointed out to the Minister of Finance, it's not just our money that we're spending, they're writing checks for disaster relief funding. Yeah, right. so, so they're writing their own checks to fix their problems. So when you equate that, that is actually coming out of their pocket, you're right, we can make some other changes or we can invest in some changes to the infrastructure. Um, I, I will say, again, I've, I've been at it for quite a while now, on the plan, it, it's not about the, the plan. They're still following it. If you talk to the MNR, if they follow the plan, so it, there, there's more water in the system than the system can manage. That is the fundamental issue. I, I agree with you. There's some abilities at times to go below the plan, which is still part of the plan, but for whatever reason, those triggers are not being activated, right. which says the plan. Right, so there's a history of them not going to those levels. So, and, and I, I agree. So I, we're, we're on the same page. Right. Um, I, I will talk, because there have been a number of people who have talked about an independent review, and, and especially looking back, what's gone on and everything else. Right. I'm opposed, personally, to an independent review, because all we're going to be doing to the province is saying you screwed up. And to look forward, if independent people want to go do their own thing, look backwards. But truly, I don't want anybody on the defensive. What we've identified, what the initial meeting talks about, these are issues that we have today. So now let's create a plan, clean sheet of paper, that identify with and can, can solve many of these issues going forward. And as long as we can tick off the boxes and solve the issues, we all get to the end result. We get to the desired place we want to be without anybody on the defensive. Right. Because as soon as I say I'm going to do an investigation to what you did this spring and the floods and all the problems, trust me, the, the, the oh, lips no, get the, tightened, the, the, the yeah. comments, sorry, no comment, we're in litigation. Yeah. So uh, um, what I would say, one of the things, for us, actually, item number two is more important than item number one on the very first page. As I said to you, poking the bear in such a nice way 
that it stays on the agenda, that it doesn't slide off. And that's really kind of probably what we're saying. For us, we think the most important thing is understanding the cost. And that's why I said, for a government that says they're for the people and not wasting money, that I think that you can say, well, look at, you know, it, these are, you know, our capital costs. Yeah. What about people like So those? Sorry, I'm Martin, I, I really need to yep. move the meeting forward. You guys are just having a little... Yeah, well, I'll send you a note, I, I think there's some stuff I, that I, I'm just yet. suggesting that, in, in fact, we've got a great presentation from you and that there's people in the audience as, as well that are hearing right. and that um, some of us will make sure that this doesn't fall off the right. Well, off. thank you. I and, really and, appreciate your time. Um, I don't know how that whole structure is going to look, and I don't suggest we even try to decide today. Um, but again, I, I thank you for your well, presentation, and it was very important. I also want to bring forward our, our, um, our new chief uh, to have thank a, you I'm putting you on the spot now, to discuss uh, your thoughts about going forward as far as our um, emergency plan and things during the flooding. Thank you, Martin. Through the Madam Chair. Um, so over the last two days, I've attended uh, two meetings, one in Bracebridge with uh, the CAO and uh, was with the Disaster Relief Assistance Program officials. Uh, and in those meetings, we actually had some discussions around uh, what our residents could do in terms of getting some sort of compensation back from the government. Uh, last night, there was another meeting uh, that I thought was just going to be on the same subject matter, but in Huntsville, it was actually a council meeting, an open council meeting, where I was educated on exactly what occurred with the flooding event from Huntsville's perspective. So I asked uh, the fire chief there, uh, Mr. Hernan, for a copy of that presentation so I could present that to council. Um, and having not been in the area during the flood, I'm completely um, open to all ideas, let's call it that. So uh, from my perspective and in talking to our emergency folks, uh, our, sorry, our team, our personnel, um, from what I could tell, where we're at today, we were doing all the right things in terms of emergency management from a community perspective. Um, our go forward at this point is we have two things. One, we want to have a hot wash, uh, which essentially is a debriefing with our team to look at things that we could have improved upon and the second thing is we are looking at a community-wide survey to hear back um, from constituents about what they felt that we did. And from those, we will present those to council, and then we'll have new directives, hopefully from council. Thank you to you, the Chair. Um, so the lessons learned mm -hmm. after every big event, every good project, whatever you did, get the pros and cons. So. We're going to do that through a survey? A little bit on the survey, um, a lot through the debriefing with our own internal teams. How about the public? Through the survey, we're hoping to get some feedback. Uh, I would then go to council with a report, and then maybe after that, what I would suggest is we do uh, a very similar event to what happened in Huntsville, um, yes. because there was some amazing feedback that uh, staff received in that event. So um, if I can... If you, if you can indulge me for a second through the, through the chair. Um, they had, and I don't know Huntsville at all, so, I, so bear with me. They had identified that the bridge is actually a source of frustration for the flow through, uh, and, and, and actually the center pillar is a problem. So there's some debate around uh, whether or not they need to improve that piece of infrastructure, uh, and as well as what we discussed here, and I didn't realize that they are the high side, so they showed where Algonquin not all of Algonquin Park comes into our watershed. Some of it goes to Ottawa. So where the previous dele delegate uh, had mentioned uh, that basically a lot of that water caused Ottawa's problem. So there's a lot of learning for me to do in this. And because I'm, I'm just getting my feet wet with it, uh, I looked at also another interesting fact. Uh, yeah, sorry. Pardon the <laughs> Pardon the, I'm bad for that, sorry. You're going to find that I'm that guy. Anyway, um, we gave away sandbags, which was really um, instrumental uh, from a comfort standpoint to our residents. And you may think to yourself, what is he talking about? Of course, sandbags. Uh, Huntsville, they did not. Uh, and they're getting a lot of flack for that. Um, 
yes, sandbags divert water, and maybe they're not great for pooling water. But for our residents, it was, a, it was a, not only a source of comfort, but it's good that the community did that. And I would suggest to council that we continue to do that. Um, we can only do so much. As we know, the watershed is managed by the province. Um, it's on uh, persons like myself and staff to keep that issue in front of the province so that we don't have to incur more costs in our emergency management program. Hopefully I answered your question. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just to clarify one of uh, Chief Merrill's comments, the survey will be sh sort of a short 10 question, 10 or 11 questions, and it'll be through a portal on our website. And that'll be open for the public uh, to comment on our actions during the flood event. And so uh, that sort of external perspective, the internal perspective will be presented through uh, a report to uh, committee uh, next uh, month. I just want to also share, though, with staff that um, we have a number of people that were affected by the flood that do not have internet access to their uh, to their property, and so I hope that we can find another method to reach out to them, whether it's just handing out the surveys, like, and also maybe doing a check on the smoke alarms. Whatever that looks like, yeah, I'm just suggesting that there could be an opportunity to to touch base with people, um, not just through our, our um, through the internet. Thank you. Very quickly through you, the chair. I completely agree. I think one of the things that um, may come out is just our opportunity to communicate with our constituents. There are a lot, of, like the gentleman who was uh, presenting earlier today about the sand on the road. Those are handwritten notes, and, and so we, we just have to really be careful that we are mindful of that. So I totally support that. Okay. Thank you. How do you feel? Oh, I feel great. <laughs> it's no different. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcome. It's more along the line, how long do I have to wait for a comfort break? Uh, you know what, that all depends on how you guys manage this. Okay. 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 Uh, okay, uh, Nora, if you wanted to come forward, please. Chair, Mayor, Council, thank you for hearing us today. I'm Nora Fountain, representing the Muskoka Lakes Chamber of Commerce at 3181 Muskoka Road 169, Unit 5, Bala. And as you know from the letter that's in your package from the Bala Cranberry Festival, and Tanya had just left with her son, so hopefully she'll come back in. Um, she's representing the Bala Cranberry Festival. Um, and also a letter that I have forwarded that will summarize this delegation. You know that the festival has had to move out of its office as the building was sold that it was in. That was a very quick sale. So they immediately started looking for a home and they approached us in May. Um, they approached us about using the Windsor Park Tourism Information Booth. We think that's a win-win. With the festival there, people can still stop for info and if they need further guidance, they'll be sent further down the road to our office where we can help them more comprehensively. More importantly, it's a great exposure spot for the Bala Cranberry Festival, and we think it will be a wonderful way to continue to welcome people from that side of Bala. There's just one piece of paperwork that uh, needs to be dealt with in order to make this happen. Uh, as the township owns the land, there is a lease agreement from 1991, and you have that information in your package, that specifies that the building can only be used as a tourist information booth. Today we are respectfully asking that the language be broadened to include tourism related activities. It's a relatively simple change, I, I hope that uh, you would think so, which then it would make it possible for the Bala Cranberry Festival to use it through to the end of October and we can make room for them to store materials right through the winter as well. We know that we're asking for a quick decision from you, but I'm sure you can appreciate with the festival only four months away, the festival needs to get settled in right away. 
I'm here today to tell you that we fully support this use of the building, and we hope you will as well. Thank you. We look forward to the Council's direction. Thank you. Staff, um, is, it, is it staff's opinion that the wording is, is not um, broad enough as it is? Yes, thank you. So currently the bylaw um, authorizes information booth. The, um, camps, the Cranberry Festival will be using it as an office. So and I see that as two separate things. Unfortunately, the um, communications and economic development officer is not available today. Um, you know, this we've leased this building to, uh, the space to the Chamber of Commerce, not the Cranberry Festival. So those are all other considerations, insurance requirements, costs of what is going to be, um, you know, who's paying for the cost of the facility, et cetera. How is that all working? So those are some of the details that um, I think need to be addressed. And I'm kind of relaying that on behalf of uh, other so, staff. Um, uh, the, the recommendation is, is that they would uh, first deal with um, our economic development officer and bring forward a resolution. Would that be the correct? I, I believe that they want to move in now. And so that's why um, the request is here. There hasn't been the opportunity to do a staff report. Um, is that my, is my understanding correct, Nora? It, this has come up very quickly in May, so there hasn't been a staff report. It was actually Corey that discovered the the uh, lease agreement from 1991. Otherwise, we would have had them come in and just share that space starting June 1st. We didn't realize that there was a piece, of, there was a document outlining this lease agreement. So, uh, and again, while it's an office, it's an office for a tourism-related activity. That's why we thought perhaps we could just uh, adjust the language somewhat. As for, oh, I just wanted to actually, if I could just address one other thing as well. Because the building is still belongs to the Chamber of Commerce, we do insure it. We are, we are um, to take care of the maintenance of the building, et cetera. Uh, in the past, the power was, we actually, somewhere in that office, there is a key to the washrooms where the power is. And it was always just the, we flicked the switch. Um, and the power came from the township, and it was never there was never actually any monies that flowed back and forth. So that's something that you might want to look at about the cost of that. Um, but it's very minor. But those are uh, those to to your point. There are some of those details through the chair. I, I think that a, a staff report has to come forward. Um, I don't think a decision can be made around the table today with even more information as we think and I I can add a few things too over the years that I've known about that building and things and so um, I believe that it, uh, the proper way to, to move this forward is by having a staff report um, If, if uh, committee wishes a staff report to come back, that will be the case. Uh, the suggested wording appears to be uh, appropriate in this instance. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, uh, this makes eminent, eminent sense. Eminent sense. I mean, to me, this is the right thing to do, but it does need to be done, you know, after we consider uh, the. Uh, all the details, things like insurance, rights of uh, sublet, and so forth. But I'm wondering, you know, from a practical perspective, if we can allow someone to take uh, occup occupancy now and, and sort it out over the next 30 days uh, because of the uh, four months to the event and get these people and let them start focusing on the right things. And we'll just instruct uh, uh, Corey uh, in his official capacity uh, to take such steps as are necessary to get whatever docs need to be signed up to give it effect. Could I have that in the head if that's the direction that you're comfortable right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Or are you waiting for anything? Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got the majority of councils now. So, um, yeah. Could I just ask one? 
one quick question. Was this building not going to be moved uh, into Port Carling? This is a different building, is it? What, what wasn't We're there? We're building a new one here. Oh, so that's changed. Okay. The, the clerk has recommended that we bring a resolution forward tomorrow uh, that will uh, just eliminate the head nodding for, for the time being and uh, that it'll make clear what our intentions are for the next number of days moving forward. Everyone good with that? Yes. Great. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Okay, does anyone else have anything they want to add quickly? Good, I'm going to do read resolution. It's moved by Councillor Roberts, sec second by Councillor Jagowitz. Be it resolved that this meeting adjourn at 12.42 p.m. The next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on Thursday, July 11th, 2019 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair and the next regular meeting of the Planning Committee will